When someone enters another world, he gets the strongest abilities, but in this story the main character uses the magic of the earth. The young guy finished the construction of the road. The man takes his hand and thanks him and says that it will be easier for him to trade now. The guy thinks about the fact that he cannot defeat the strongest enemies with one blow, and that he is not even a chosen hero, but there are people who he pleases and that's good. The guy tells the butler that he needs to go home. The butler thought to himself that he would never believe that a six-year-old child had made such a road. The guy's name is Michio Tsuchida. He was 35 years old. One day he was returning home from a part-time job on his day off. Suddenly, a girl screamed. The bandit was holding her and shouting that he would end up in another world if he sacrificed this child to Murgas. He asks her to take him to another world. The guy doesn't know what to do, he's getting chills. What are the police doing? The hero remembers that bad things happened to him when he was shivering, but he couldn't leave because there was a child there. Michio rushes to save the girl and throws the killer away. The killer walks towards the girl, but Michio shields her from the knife with his back. The brawler is stopped by the police. The girl's mother thanks the hero, but he slowly loses consciousness. He can barely hear their voices. Suddenly the voices get louder, he suddenly opens his eyes. He sees a beautiful woman in front of him. He doesn't understand where he is at the moment. Michio sees this furniture and clothes for the first time. He had a terrible headache and at the same time a lot of information was coming into his head. After a while, he remembered that he was now Cain St. Rose, the damned son of Viscount St. Rose. He thought he was reincarnated in another world. The woman asked him what happened to him and if he was okay. It was the first lady of the house, Lydia St. Rosa. She was not the real mother of the main character, but she replaced his mother, who died of an illness. She always looked after him very carefully. She tells him that he fell down the stairs and almost died. Cain's stomach rumbled, he was starving. Lydia had prepared in advance and brought him porridge, which looked very appetizing. Lydia began to feed him like a child. Cain said that he could eat himself, but she did not listen to him. An airplane is flying. She patted him on the head for swallowing everything. However, she told him that he had become somehow different, because he used to be a more spoiled child. The guy immediately realized that he needed to pretend and bent his head into her chest. Suddenly, the door was opened by the eldest daughter Alice. She asked if she could come in and Lydia allowed her, although she had said many times that the door should only be opened when she was answered. The girl ran up to the bed and asked Cain if he was alright. She said he needed to sleep. Lydia said that she was very worried when Cain was unconscious and the girl was embarrassed. She checked to see if he had a fever. Cain told her that her hands were nice and cold. The man who used to be Cain had three brothers and an older sister and they were all very beautiful. My father came into the room and made a remark to Alice so that she would not bother her brother. My father said that Cain looks much better now. He decided that Cain would be able to be baptized next week. Cain looked at his father questioningly. Cain's homeland is small for a nobleman. There are only 5,000 people in his city. In this world, a child is baptized at the age of five and God always gives one skill. Absolutely any skill can fall out. For example, a swordsman can get a skill for magic. God is testing everyone's abilities. Therefore, the future of a person depends on which skill will fall out. Cain worried that his life would be decided at the age of five. Everything was different from his previous life. He thought that his past life had not turned out well. He was worried, but he thought how cool it was in this world. He should enjoy this life. He thought that once he was reborn, he would have countless items, strong magic and alchemy with all the attributes, and he would be able to become a warrior. I wonder what he'll get. Cain was looking forward to it. They ended up in the temple. Lydia and Alice wished him good skill and good luck. He entered the room where the bishop was. He welcomed Mr. Cain. He began the rite of baptism. The bishop asked me to take his hand and close my eyes. The bishop began to pray. Cain heard a familiar voice. He kept saying, you've finally come. Cain found himself in the world of the gods. The goddess Guardia stood in front of him. Cain already knew that she was the local earth goddess. Guardia called him smart and Cain immediately realized that he was reading his mind. She asked if she remembered how he died on earth. He told her everything as it was and she thanked her because the girl he saved was connected to this goddess. Guardia would have been in big trouble if he hadn't. She took his hands. The goddess's hands were so soft. Cain was glad that the girl was safe now, but he did not understand why the goddess did not help her. She replied that she could do it, but it would lead to a distortion of the earth and this world. 
The guy was glad that his life had changed the world for the better. Guardia showed Kane his status window. The goddess was surprised because he already had the skills. She said that when Kane's real mother died, she gave him her recovery magic skill. In gratitude for the rescue, the goddess decided to give Kane three skills. Suddenly, a slot machine appeared out of nowhere. Kane was very surprised and asked why it was impossible to choose skills on your own. The goddess told how some heroes chose skills that upset the balance of this world and so the gods made the choice random. Instead increasing the number, Kane pressed the start button and hoped for good skills. He got the magic of the earth, countless numbers and the magic of the magic circle. He did not know if the magic of the earth was strong, so he was tormented by doubts. The goddess was a little shocked and said that his luck was low. Guardia was worried about him, so she gave him her blessing. Now that she had given him her blessing, he could go to church and pray for her. She said she would watch him occasionally. She said goodbye to him and Cain returned to the real world. The bishop saw that he had three skills and the blessing of the goddess Guardia. The guy understood that his skills were poor, but he hoped that his characteristics should be high, because he has a blessing. He opened the status window, but his stats were very low. Cain did not know what would happen to his life now. Cain went home with his father. His sister asked him what skills he had been given. Their father told them that he had two magic skills and one inherited from his mother. Cain realized that infinite magic was hidden from his father. My sister praised my brother for having three skills. Alice also had an inherited skill from her mother. Lydia asked Luke what the magic of the magic circle was, but he replied that he did not know and would write a letter about it to Benjamin and ask him to look for information. However, Luke was slightly unhappy with the earth magic, but Lydia said it was too early to worry and it was worth going back to the mansion and see what was there. His father told Cain that even family members are not allowed to watch the status board. Even trying to look at them is bad form. Cain was upset. He thought it would be much better to show the status window to his family, but did not argue, since this is a strange world and the rules here are different. Maybe when he has friends he will show them, but it's too early to think about it. Cain returned home and began to carefully read the description of his skills. The magic of the magic circle of the first level allowed him to disassemble the skill of the first level into a magic circle and write it on the scrolls, magic stones and so on. However, he required an analysis skill that he didn't have yet. The guy considered the skill useless at this level. Earth magic was the most standard earth magic. Restorative magic was also standard. His skill of infinite amount of magic power looked amazing and allowed him to receive magic power from the outside. Kane didn't know whether to rejoice or cry. Next in his description was a note from Guardia. It read, For Kane who hasn't learned the magic manipulation skill yet, I'm disabling the infinite magic skill until you learn how to manipulate magic well. Kane checked his blessing. It gave a percentage improvement in the power of earth magic and restoration magic, as well as reduced the consumption of magic for some skills. The blessing also endowed him with abnormal resistance and comprehension of foreign languages. Cain was glad that he was able to use at least some magic. The butler and his older sister called out to Cain. His father wanted to see the guy. He didn't understand what his father wanted. Suddenly Alice asked if Cain was listening to her. She asked me not to ignore her. She told him that she was surprised when he locked himself in the room when they returned home. The butler said that Alice did the same thing when she got the skills. She was unhappy that the butler had told Cain everything. He apologized to Alice. Cain smiled at the fact that she was still a small child. Luke and Lydia were sitting on the couch, and the atmosphere was tense. The father spoke to Cain. Luke told Cain that it might be difficult, but he should try not to get depressed. The guy was in shock. Lydia yelled at Luke for being so harsh. Cain asked why he should be depressed. His father explained to him that his earth magic had no attack skills, even if his level increased, and the details of the magic circle were unknown. His father told him that he did not know if Cain would have a decent future. Cain was puzzled that they thought his magic was so useless. Lydia rushed to her son. She said they wouldn't give up on him and he shouldn't be afraid. They were all very worried about him. The guy remembered that everything was wrong in his previous life, he did not want to upset his parents. Cain clenched his hand into a fist and told his parents that he needed to learn the skill of manipulating magic in order to fully use the magic of the earth. He asked his father to teach him this skill, if he knows how to do it, or to give him the opportunity to visit the library. Cain said that he would be fine, because even the magic of the earth can do a lot if you master it correctly. If that didn't work, he could cultivate the field with his magic, or heal the wounded with a recovery skill. He asked his parents not to worry. They were inspired. Luke decided to write a letter to Benjamin so that he would come to them for the holidays. Luke thought that Benjamin knew how to teach his son the skill of manipulating magic. 
Cain decided that he had to do everything so that they would not be sad, because he was only five years old and he had at least fifty to fix everything. By the way, that brother Benjamin, whom his father mentioned, is currently studying at the academy. He was a genius who discovered the possibilities of earth magic. Six months have passed. Today is the day when Cain's brother returns. His father forbade Cain to use magic before learning the skill of manipulating magic, otherwise Cain could lose his skills. Only brother Benjamin could help him with this. His brother entered the mansion. He was the second son of the St. Rose family. Cain greeted him. His brother also greeted him and his sister. The butler informed Benjamin that Luke and Lydia were waiting for him in the living room. This also applies to Alice and Cain. Cain thought of his brother as a very smart guy, because he became an orderly at the age of 14, the first in the history of the Institute of Magical Arts and Crafts. His parents met him and asked him how he got there, how his studies were going, and so on. Cain thought that his brother, at the age of 14, was holding himself more solidly than he was at 35. His father immediately told him about his request. Luke asked him to help Cain learn the skill of manipulating magic. Benjamin accepted their request and looked at his younger brother with interest. The next morning, before training, Benjamin asked Cain about his skills. Cain talked about everything except the skill of an infinite amount of magic. Also, my brother, despite the prohibition to ask about someone else's status, wondered how much magic he had. Because the more he knows about Cain, the easier it will be for him to teach him. Cain opened the status window and called the number 18 -0. Benjamin asked him again because he couldn't believe what he was hearing. It turned out to be about six times more than his own, so he decided to change the way he trained. He put a special device on Cain and forbade him to take it off until he learned the skill of manipulating magic. Cain felt it absorbing his powers. It was a magic belt that was usually worn by criminals so that they could not use magic. It sucks out the magic of the owner. It begins to glow when the wearer's magic value reaches 10. My brother looked at the device and saw that he really had 18 o magic points. Benjamin suggested starting the first lesson on mastering the skill of magic manipulation. He asked to concentrate the magic power in the area below the navel. My brother was surprised that Cain was able to do it the first time. Cain felt the warmth with his hands, but suddenly that warmth disappeared. Benjamin asked him to try to hold this heat until he lost consciousness. It took a couple of days and finally Cain was able to keep warm even when he wasn't concentrating. However, he was very tired and asked to stop, but Benjamin said that if he did not have time to learn the skill, he would have to give him a whole year. Cain wondered if his brother was a demon. They started the second lesson. Benjamin asked him to concentrate the magic, and then he asked him to move the collected magic power to his chest. Cain imagined her slowly rising to his chest, but she didn't budge at all. Ten minutes passed, but she didn't move and Cain was exhausted. Then his brother decided to help him and the two of them started training. Benjamin said that now Cain would be hurt and would have to be patient. Cain screamed in pain, but endured. His brother explained that this was the process of expanding narrow magical paths so that magic could pass through them and it was natural that he was in pain. This was called circulation and Cain would only achieve mastery when he learned how to move magic through his entire body, literally through every limb. Then Cain became convinced that his brother was a real demon. Ten days have passed and Cain has learned how to circulate magic throughout his body. After all, overtime, which became a habit when he was a slave to the company, helped him achieve results faster. The third lesson began. Benjamin asked Cain to join his palms in front of his chest to make a circle, then make a circulation between the rings. At this time his palms should be perfectly aligned. However, Cain was unable to complete this task and Benjamin offered him several options. Cain chose his brother's help, even though he knew it would hurt. He started the cycle again, and his brother poured his magic into it. The formation of his magic became thinner and sharper and it became very painful for him. But they continued to circulate magic. Finally, when he finished, Cain almost cried. His brother asked him to repeat it, but each time taking his hands further and further away from each other. After two hours, Cain could circulate magic through his hands without touching them. Thanks to his brother's rigorous training, he was finally able to master the release. The fourth lesson began. This exercise is dangerous, so they went outside. Ben said that Cain should not lose concentration in the middle of the exercise. If this does happen, then he must raise his hands up strictly diagonally. Cain began to concentrate. Ben asked me to hold the magic between my palms and spin it into a sphere. He could feel the magic being released from his body. However, he began to lose concentration and an explosion occurred. Ben hit him on the head for not following the instructions. He said that magic is not a toy and that he almost hurt himself because of inattention. Cain asked his brother to finish his studies anyway. 
Ben agreed. Four days later, Kane's magic manipulation skill was added. He was very happy. Ben praised him and said that he learned everything very quickly. He also showed that if he could complete this training, he would be able to attack without spells. Ben blew up the earth and left a crater much larger than Kane's. Kane thought that his brother was from the world of Dragon Ball and decided never to contradict him. Two days after New Year's Eve, Ben left. Kane remembers how harsh the training was, but the feeling of achievement was too pleasant and he couldn't afford to stop training. Now he will use his magic to the limit of his abilities. Kane remembered the magic drawing bracelet. If he doesn't take it off, he's going to run out of magic soon. He took it off. The guy decided to use his brother's method again. He repeated all the stages and released a charge of stone magic. He was very happy and happy for himself. Now he decided to try the whole spell. She was very small compared to his brother. Kane ran out of magic because his bracelet took everything else. He raised his level by training with Ben. Kane woke up, it was already evening. He felt more magic than usual, because before that the bracelet had limited his strength. At the moment, his magic score was 2100. So far, he had only one hundredth of that power. He went to practice magic, but Lydia noticed him and asked where he was going and why he wasn't at lunch. Kane told her that he studied writing with his sister so as not to upset her. He felt guilty for this little deception. He was walking down the street and noticed that the hole had not disappeared. His earth magic was permanent. He used the removal of the skill to return everything to its previous state. He was very surprised when the hole disappeared. But Kane noticed that removing magic requires almost twice as much magic as creating it. He decided to check everything thoroughly. When he finished, he thought that earth magic wasn't so bad. The next day, he was inspired, because he was going to train his magic even more. Alice noticed him and thought that he was lucky, because he goes outside every day while she is studying. She said out loud that she was tired of doing math. Lydia noticed her and asked if she liked studying with Kane, but she replied that Kane did not study with her. At this time, Kane created the cube of the earth. He was surprised, because he thought that an ordinary stone would appear, not a cube. He continued to practice earth magic and created a bunch of blocks. He felt like some kind of builder. He decided to sum up the results of today. He realized that if he used unlimited magical power, he could even dig a well. And the creation of blocks is useful in construction. He wanted to continue the treading, but Lydia interrupted him. They found out that Cain was lying. His sister was angry at him because he was the only one playing outside. His stepmother dragged him home and forced him to study. Cain understood everything that was written, but he was forced to practice meaningless spelling. As a 35-year-old, he had to do exercises for six-year-olds, so it's been half a year since Ben left. As a result of Cain's constant training, the level of earth magic rose to the second, and his skill of an infinite amount of magical power was replaced by an active one. In addition, Ono has learned the skill of avoiding learning for the sake of magic. He decided to check the changes. He's got three more abilities. They were very useful, so Kane did not understand why earth magic was considered unsuccessful. During the training, he created a stone wall and started attacking it with a stone bullet. It took him ten rounds to break it down, the wall turned out to be quite strong. A man passing by said that Kane was doing well. It was Hardy, the gardener and coachman of the St. Rose house. He lost his arm during a battle with demons, after which he was hired by the family. He is very hardworking, and although he has an intimidating appearance, he had a very gentle nature. Kane asked what he was going to do. Hardy wanted to make a field for sweet potatoes. Kane loved this fruit very much. Kane deleted the result of the training so that they would not interfere with Hardy and the stones disappeared. He started working. Kane saw how hard it was for him with one hand, and there was still a lot of work to do. So he decided to help him. He wanted to use earth magic. Hardy showed him the approximate size of the potato field. It was about the size of a badminton field. Kane concentrated and used the earth digging skill. In an instant, the ground became soft and pliable. He used this ability many more times and completed the entire field. Hardy thanked him for his help, because he had saved him about 10 days of work and he could start another one. Hardy brought Satsuma, which was the local equivalent of sweet potatoes from our world. Garid started work and Kane immediately called out to him. Shouldn't potatoes be planted as seedlings? Kane asked. He received a negative response. In this world, Satsuma is planted like potatoes. The knowledge of crop cultivation technology in this world is not at all the same as in the modern one. Kane asked him to share the potatoes with him. 
but Kane didn't find the seedlings, so he used the clay skill to create the box. A few days later, Kane's potatoes began to sprout. At the same time, Hardy had very poor results. Now Kane decided to create beds, but Hardy didn't know anything about it, so Kane did everything himself. Kane showed and told him the advantages of the beds. Hardy was delighted with his knowledge and asked how he knew this. Kane lied that it was written in his earth magic skill. Kane and Alice are sitting in class. The teacher gave Alice an arithmetic problem, but she was not good at solving two-digit arithmetic problems. She stated that she easily performs tasks with a single number. Kane thought that she would definitely succeed. It dawned on him, is there an abacus in this world? After all, it can be used even without electricity. He decided to create it after lessons. He had a good idea of how to create it, because he had learned how to use it. He used magic and created an abacus. He picked it up, but it immediately crumbled. Then he created it again, imagining that he was creating it from iron. This time it worked out. Kane enjoyed his work very much. Although his instrument was noticeably larger than on Earth, it still allowed calculations to be made. But he didn't know if they existed in this world and if he had invented a bicycle. He decided to ask his father since Benjamin was not in the house. He heard Luke thinking out loud about how he could pay off his family's debt. Kane was seen by a maid and he asked her where Lydia was. When he found out that she was in the library, he went straight there. He wondered what would happen to the family if his father's words about debts turned out to be true. He couldn't let the family break up. He decided to make his land bigger and richer by using earth magic. On the way to the library, Kane thought about what to do to pay off his debts. He spoke Lydia's name loudly to get permission to enter. Kane could not have imagined that their library was so huge. Lydia told Kane that she would ask for permission to enter, because he can read. Kane wanted to start a conversation, but saw a glowing book behind her and without thinking told her about it. Lydia gave this book to him, but she didn't see the glow. This book turned out to be about how to recreate things from Kane's home world using magic. He read the title out loud. Lydia was surprised that he could read it. Kane read the name on the machine, because it was in Japanese. Lydia asked the guards to call Luke and Randolph. Kane found out about it later. This book was written by a brave hero 12 generations before Kane and was inherited in their family. It seems that at some point Kane's ancestors became unable to read the works of the great hero. Kane had to come up with an excuse, because he couldn't just say that he was reborn. Thanks to the book, he gained access to the archives. Kane learned that the brave hero was a reincarnation just like him. He was a Japanese who was summoned to another world to exterminate demons. In the end, he managed to make peace with the demon king. He had a child and lived happily ever after, but he continued to miss Japan. He left behind a book for the reincarnated like him. That was the essence of the hero's book. A blonde-haired boy with his mouth open was sitting in the library. The book of the hero lay in front of him in a beautiful binding. Kane thought that he did not even think that there were other reincarnations besides him and did not know that there was some kind of hero there. This, of course, shocked the boy, but due to the fact that he received too much information, he decided to think about it later, and first he had to go on business. Kane did not tell his parents about the bills last time and thought about using the hero's book. Lady Lily pulled the boy by the hand and led him away. The boy was standing in front of his parents, his mother was drinking tea, and his father was sitting on the other side of the table. Lydia asked her son what happened. Kane said that he wanted his parents to see something. The boy was holding an abacus in his hands. The parents got up, the mother asked what it was, and the father just looked at the boy in surprise. Kane put abacus number 8 on the table and showed it to his parents. Lydia picked them up and wondered if there really was an abacus in this world. The boy stood in front of his parents, waiting to hear their reaction. He thought about what would happen if they did not want to receive something made by a child. Lady Lydia shook the abacus and asked her son, What is this thing that had a lot of balls on it? The enthusiastic boy explained that it was an abacus, an instrument used in arithmetic. The father asked his son about arithmetic. Cain thought for a while and explained that the balls on this thing stood for the number five. Both parents thought a little and opened their mouths in surprise and began to praise their son, the mother clapped with joy. My father said that it would be much easier and faster to solve mathematical problems with the help of accounts. Suddenly, Randolph the butler came into the room, which made Lydia surprised and asked if he was here. The man who entered asked if Mr. and Mrs. wanted to see him. Kane's father told Randolph that he wanted him to take a look at something. The boy took the abacus and showed it to the butler, explaining that one of the balls stood for the number one. Randolph understood everything and said that he had not seen such a thing in all his years of life. Kane was delighted and thought that he knew that such a thing did not exist in this world. 
The butler asked the young master how he created this. The boy was confused and thought that it would be strange if a six-year-old child already knows Abacus so well. Because because of this he might get into trouble. Cain told the adults that it was written about in the book of the hero, but at that time he was thinking that such a thing was not written there. Or rather, he had not read the whole book yet. Lady Lydia went up to her son and asked if he could really read it. The boy got scared and started denying and waving his arms. He screamed that wasn't what he meant. Cain said that there were pictures in the book and he was able to make this item using earth magic. The boy said that he understood how to use it, and the numbers were in the language of their country, so he kind of understood. The father turned away, and the mother stiffened a little. Cain continued to share his joy with his parents, because he never thought that he would be able to solve arithmetic, which they learned in lessons in such a simple and understandable way. The boy said that Alice would be very happy when he gave it to her. The father of the family carefully examined the unknown accounts and said that only Cain could have made the item. The man turned to Randolph, who turned to the boy, asking how many more of these things he could make. Cain said that he only needed land as material, so he could make a hundred or two hundred a day if he worked hard. The butler bowed and said it was great and asked if he could do the abacus now. The boy happily confirmed and was provided with a tray with the necessary soil. Cain raised his palm to the ground and with the help of magic was going to create abacus out of clay. The astonished parents opened their mouths and bills appeared on the table. All the adults gasped, and Lydia ran up to her son and hugged him, saying that it was just fantastic. Mr. St. Rose raised the bills and said it was amazing. The butler expressed the hope that this would help them rebuild their family, and the boy's father nodded in agreement. His mother patted Cain on the head, and his father asked him to do him a favor. Mr. St. Rose told the boy that he did not want to push, but asked if his son could make such accounts with excess. Cain replied that he could, but asked his father why he needed so much. The man did not explain anything and patted the boy on the head, thanking him in advance. So they did. Cain spent every day making abacuses. The workers brought him soil. Lady Lydia asked her son to take a break, and the boy brought some of the resulting bills to Alice. Before he knew it, 2,000 abacuses were completed. There were piles of bills in a huge cart. Cain raised his head, trying to look at the very top of the stacks and thought that they looked strange, because initially he just wanted to make one for his sister Alice. The father in formal clothes approached the boy and said that he was going to take these abacuses to the commercial guild and, if possible, he might start receiving royalties for them. The boy was surprised, and his father said that Cain probably did not understand this yet. The man laughed, and his son thought that he understood so much that it was better not to tell about it. The man instructed the butler Randolph to make preparations, to which he bowed and agreed with Sir. And that's how Cain's abacuses were brought to the merchant guild. The boy was curious, so he went there with Randolph. The secretary of the commercial guild listened incredulously at first. But in the end, after seeing the accounts, the eyes of the man in round glasses lit up. After the successful registration of the abacus, Cain had to add a new special insignia, in the form of the sun. A sign was needed in case someone released a similar product, so there was nothing to be done. Cain asked the secretary with glasses if there would be a fight over authenticity if a similar product appeared. The guild employee replied that everything was the will of the god Hermes, the patron saint of trade. The young entrepreneur crossed his arms and thought that no one, of course, would complain about God's decision. A few days later, the boy from the St. Rose family was recognized as the first developer of Abacus. His father and mother Lydia were very pleased with their son's success. Something surprised Cain the most, Randolph sold his inventions for the price of three gold coins apiece. A cart with a horse pulled up to the house, filled to the top with huge bags of gold. In this world, there were copper, silver, gold and platinum coins, each with a face value of 100 conventional units. If a copper coin was worth 10 units, then a gold coin was worth 100,000. The family sold all the abacuses for 6,000 gold coins, in other words, for 600 million yen. Presenting the proceeds, Cain thought that it was too huge a figure to really feel it, and even more so this amount was unaffordable during the guy's time as an employee of the company. The boy was thinking that Randolph the butler clearly knew what he was doing. Cain walked next to his father and thought that they had already dealt with the issues at home. The head of the family told the butler that they had solved the urgent problem of money, but in the meantime they had little time left, so they needed to repair the castle walls and improve the roads before winter. Randolph agreed and said that they would have to spend the remaining money carefully. Cain stood between the talking men and thought that they still had a lot to do. His father cared so much about people, so he really was a real lord. The boy apologized to his father and asked if he really needed to make an additional abacus, because he could make more. 
The blond man was surprised by the boy's words and asked if it was true. Kane St. Rose created another thousand bills in a few days. The butler loaded them into a cart and transported them to the city. The boy looked into the room and, leaning out from behind the door, apologized to his father and said that he had finished making abacuses. The man was sitting at his desk in his office and writing something. He thanked his son and said that he had helped him a lot this time and saved people from many difficulties. The Lord patted Cain on the head and told him that he was proud that he was his son. The boy smiled and laughed. He said that it was nice when the magic of the earth helps people so much. The man said that he discussed with Lydia that the boy should be rewarded for his contribution, even if he is just a child, so he asked his son if he wanted anything. Cain thought about his father's words and realized that in a previous life he would have asked for a share of the proceeds. But in this one he was only six years old and he couldn't spend the money even if he had it. The boy thought about what he should do then, because he had nothing concrete. But if he asked for anything, he would waste this opportunity. Cain was still poor in desires from his previous life. Suddenly, the boy had an idea and told his father that he wanted to eat two satsumas the next time they cooked them. The man was surprised and asked if this was his desire. Cain confirmed, and the Lord said that the next time they cook satsuma, he will be able to eat too. The young inventor shouted with joy and said that now they can look forward to tasting delicious satsumas and continue to develop their territory. In the early morning, the sun shone on the St. Rose family's property. Two maids in white aprons and caps were standing in the hallway. One of them with short black hair yawned, covering her mouth and said that it was always hard for her in the morning. Another maid, with blonde hair tied in a neat bun, replied that it was also difficult for her to work the early shift, because at such a time almost everyone was asleep. Kane appeared in the hallway, stretching. He greeted the girls and wished them good morning. The girls also wished the little gentleman a good morning and said that he got up early. The boy smiled and explained that he was going for a run and would be back for breakfast. The boy waved to the maids and ran away. The girls were surprised by the run and remembered that he was only six years old. The blonde girl excitedly shouted that Mr. Kane was a strong boy, and they had to follow his example. The second girl agreed with this. There were five girls in aprons and caps in the hallway. Three of them stood silently with their mouths open. One was sweeping the floors, and another was carrying a cart with dishes to the dining room of the mansion. Randolph, the mustachioed butler, noted that the morale of the maids was unusually high today, for which he praised them. Outside, Kane was doing preparatory exercises before jogging. In order to reform the estate, the boy immediately took action. Firstly, he needed to strengthen his physical strength, so Cain decided to improve all his indicators. The Lord's son woke up at six in the morning to gain physical strength and attended classes with his sister Alice before lunch. After that, he practiced earth magic and magic manipulation in the training area. Cain studied by reading the Book of the Hero and other books in the library. He practiced recovery magic 20 times a day, and after three months he finally improved his performance. The boy was looking at a magic board that displayed his stats and stats. The guy noticed additional items for earth magic and restoration magic and decided to look at them. On the board was written about magic of the earth, sand, mud and drainage. Kane thought about the objects he saw and saw the instructions on the magic of the earth of the third level. Sand magic had 20 mana. It changed the earth within a radius of 50 centimeters deep into sand. The mud magic also had a mana of 20 and changed the earth to mud. The dehumidification magic had 30 mana and evaporated 10% of the water from the soil. Mud and sand in an area of 30 centimeters. Cain didn't understand and thought about how he was supposed to use it. It took the boy a little time to figure this out, and he decided to turn to recovery magic first. This type of magic had a second level, a healing radius and mana of 30. It allowed the use of small healing of creatures within a radius of 3 meters in diameter, healing wounds and injuries. This magic did not allow healing of missing body members or lost blood. Cain thought that restoring the area is good and it will be useful to heal many people at once, but it is better, of course, if no one gets hurt. The boy got this magic from Lenore's mother and he wanted to use it to save people. At this rate, he will leave the most useful magic. Before classes in the library, the blonde-haired Kane was going to check out the Satsuma beds. In the garden, the boy saw a muscular, dark-haired gardener Gardi, who had only one arm. He was harvesting from one of the beds. Kane praised the man and asked how Satsuma was doing. Hardy replied that everything was just fine with the seedlings. His sown field was growing well, but everything looked much better in Mr. Kane's field. The man added that the Satsumas planted from seedlings in the boy's way were amazing. Almost all of them seemed to have taken root. Hardy's field was also taking root better than usual, but not as well as Mr. Kane's field. 
The boy sat down and stared in amazement at both beds. His seedlings were indeed bigger and more luxuriant than the gardener's. Kane said that next year he will start with Gardy seedlings and it will be even more amazing. Hardy agreed and offered to make a lot of satsuma and surprise everyone. The young people imagined how the others were enjoying their plants. The guys gathered the harvest, and the one-armed man took a large bag and said that he was returning to the estate, so he asked the boy if he would go there too. Kane agreed, and they walked back together. Hardy said that after clearing the field it was time to rest. The boy agreed and replied that it was a good idea. A dark-haired man with a bag on his back was suddenly surprised and stopped. Kane asked what happened and looked ahead. Hardy sat down on the ground and said that because of the rain the day before yesterday, a mess had formed on the road leading to the estate. People will have to walk on a broken road before the mud dries up. The worried man explained that if they did not mix sand into the porridge before the owner returned, ruts would form and the cart would not be able to travel further. Hardy apologized to young Mr. Kane and said he would go get the sand, so he asked if the boy could return to the estate alone. Kane agreed, but remembered that he could use the new earth magic. The boy asked the man to wait a minute and asked if he had a board and a large spatula or something else with which to level the ground, something shaped to make the ground level. Hardy understood everything and left. Kane knelt on the ground and dipped both palms into the mud. The boy thought that now was not the time to get tired, because he needed to help people. The son of the Lord began to use mud magic, and the earthen porridge with an area of one meter by one meter immediately became a square. The joyful boy shouted that he had done a great job. At that time, Hardy arrived without one hand. He was holding a rake and apologized for making Mr. Kane wait. The boy replied that the man came just in time and asked Hardy to try to level the dirt track. The young man with the rake was surprised and asked if the boy had applied his magic skills here as well. Kane said that he thought that if the road turned into mud, the soil would become softer and it would be easier to level it. Hardy put the rake on the dirt and was very happy. He said that it was easier and much faster to level it. The boy replied that it was great. A moment later, a meter-long patch of dirt was leveled. Hardy told Kane that all they had to do was wait for everything to dry out. The boy replied that there was not much left and he needed to try out a new magic. Kane stretched out his palms to the ground and said that now was the time to use the draining magic. Hardy opened his mouth in surprise and said that the dirt dried up instantly. Kane wiped the sweat from his forehead and smiled. The man sat down and touched the dirt. He said that the road was completely flat so the wagons would pass here without any problems. Kane looked at the flat square and said that it would be strange if they left only this area flat. He suggested that the man level the whole road before his father returned. Hardy smiled and replied that it was a good idea. The young men exchanged glances, so they worked together on leveling the road to the house. They spent an hour on everything about everything. Kane used the mastered magic of mud and drainage. Tired and sweaty workers looked at the road, and Kane was delighted. He thanked Hardy and said that thanks to him they were able to clear the road in a very short time. The man gave the boy a high five and said that everything was thanks to the magic of Mr. Kane's land. Hardy noticed that they were noticeably dirty, so he suggested that they go to the well together and clean themselves up. The blonde-haired boy agreed and on the way to the well he thought about whether his father would notice the road. After all, he would drive along it. Kane continued his thoughts and decided that on the other hand, he often reads his newspapers in the carriage, so maybe he won't notice. Kane sat in the library and studied. A voice called out to him, and the boy turned around. It was the boy's father. A man broke into the library, and his son asked him what happened. The dumbfounded lord asked Kane if he had leveled the road to the house. The boy said that he and Hardy decided to help. He was a little scared and asked if it was worth it. The father apologized and said that he did not want to scare him, but just the opposite. The Lord told his son that when they drove through the gates of the mansion in the carriage, the vibrations disappeared completely, and he thought that something was wrong. He had never driven on such a smooth and clean road. The man praised Cain and said that everything turned out very well for him and handed his son a gift. The Lord put a silver coin with a hexagonal star on the edge into the boy's hands. The boy was happy. He thanked his father and thought that he was glad that he had pleased his father. Cain said that he was thinking of sharing the gift with Hardy. The father patted his son on the head and said that it was very nice of him, but he would pay Hardy separately, so the coin was only his. Later, Hardy thanked the boy for the award. A few days later, walking along the road to the mansion, Cain noticed that puddles had appeared there again. Looking at the ruined road, he thought that he had worked so hard with Hardy, but if they leveled the road with the same method, 
Then after the rain it would be the same, so he wondered if there was a better way. Kane asked his brain to strain and asked him if there were any ideas. Suddenly an idea came to the young inventor's head and he thought, why not make a road out of cobblestones? Kane decided to make a road like in old Europe, based on knowledge from a previous life. Stone and earth were needed, so he could do everything with the help of earth magic. The boy decided that he needed to write everything down on a piece of paper before he forgot and rushed to the mansion. The plan of the cobblestone pavement included several points. First, you had to create a lot of stones and spread them out on the road using magic. Also, with the help of magic, it was necessary to cover the road with mud 10 centimeters deep. After that, dry the dirt with dehumidification magic, make the surface slightly rough, not smooth. The last step was to lay out the stones with an interval of 1 cm from each other so that they would not stick. Kane held a piece of paper with a plan in front of him and came to the conclusion that this method seemed the most time-consuming. The boy thought about the fact that he had too much work to do if he did it on the spur of the moment, so he would like to start small. Kane studied everything carefully once again and wondered what about the wells. The boy rolled up the sheet and hurried to check everything with Randolph. He would also need a hardy, so he also needed to be informed about this. The butler studied Kane's plan carefully, and the boy asked what he would say. The mustachioed man asked the young gentleman if he had made a plan. The boy confirmed, and Randolph said that Kane seemed to have the qualities of a master. The boy stared at the man's beaming smile. It was hard for him to understand what he was talking about, but Kane assumed that everything was fine. Randolph informed the Lord's son that they would also go around the well and he would inform the head of the boy's plan. Kane was delighted and thanked the butler. The man replied that there was nothing to thank him for and added that, whatever it was, but according to his calculations, it would take them about five days to finish all sections of the road to the mansion. The young man said that it was cool, because according to his calculations it turned out the same way. Kane suggested that they could have shortened the time if they had a few more people. Randolph replied that their policy was not to have an excessive staff. The boy grabbed a piece of paper with a plan and jumped joyfully, asking the man not to worry, because he would do everything possible to improve. Randolph called the fleeing boy and said that he had grown up to be a smart boy and seemed to have become a different person after coming down with an injury. Kane thought with horror that the man might have suspected something, but the butler only bowed silently and added that they were all glad to see Mr. Kane's progress. The guy's eyes sparkled, and he said that they would definitely make sure that the cobblestones were a success. The restrained Randolph replied that they would do their best and followed the Lord's son. Kane ran outside and ran to the gardener. He called Hardy and shouted that he was here. The young people came to the well that was located behind the mansion, and were going to pave the ground around the well according to their own plan. The boy showed his adult assistant a plan on a piece of paper and explained that first they had to draw a line to outline the territory for work. Kane took a long wooden stick and completed the first task. Now it was the turn of the stones. The young magician put out his palms and concentrated power in them, calling on the stone to be created in his name. Smooth rectangular cobblestones began to appear in front of the boy. Soon there were three hundred of them. Hardy said that he thought that would be enough. Then there was dirt. Kane sat down to the ground and touched it. He asked the man if he would help him. The man understood everything and began to help. A boy was turning the ground into mud, and a dark-haired man was laying out stones. After about a quarter of an hour, the final touch remained. Kane stood up and began to use the draining magic on the stones already laid out in the mud. The mud has frozen and the stones are firmly anchored in it. Hardy was delighted with the result and told Mr. Kane that everything was ready, and they had succeeded. The muscular man continued to say that they turned out to be a cobblestone pavement, and the truth is with this method, even if the ground is flooded, the stones will remain, so there will be no puddles, because the water will soak into the soil in the cracks. Kane confirmed it, but looked closer and said that it turned out to be clumsy in places. He was confused by the layout of the stones and the bumpy soil between them. Hardy was surprised and asked again, because it seemed to him that it was normal. The young builders were standing in front of the well, and the employee said that it seemed that a certain amount of area could be processed in a day, and also something needed to be thought up so that the road in front of the mansion was also paved. Kane said he would discuss it with Randolph and asked Hardy if he would join them. Suddenly, a disgruntled mother, Lady Lydia, appeared next to the guys. She found her son and scolded him for not coming to lunch, so she went looking for him and saw that the boy was digging in the dirt again. A woman in a dress and with a necklace wiped her son's face with a handkerchief and called him to go change. Kane asked his mother to be careful, because she could get her clothes dirty, to which Lydia replied that he should not have worried about such a trifle. The mother pulled her son by the hand and sternly said that she needed to talk to Luke. Kane was upset that he had upset his mother again 
But despite this, everything went according to plan in the construction. Hardy was surprised that the boy was smiling even after being scolded by Lady Lydia. After lunch, Kane and Hardy returned to the well and resumed work on paving the land around. The Lord and the butler came to watch the guys at work. Kane was surprised to see his father and Randolph and thought that his mother must have told them about the cobblestones, so they had to finish as soon as possible. And finally, everything was ready. The tired boy was sitting near the new road, and from fatigue he rested his hands on the ground. Hardy told Mr. Kane that he had done well. The boy was glad that they had finished everything before dinner. The father of the family was smiling, and Kane wondered if the presentation of their work had been successful. All the men went to the Lord's mansion and entered his office. Kane's father sat down at the table and announced that he wanted to officially offer his son a job paving the paths to the mansion. The young construction magician's eyes lit up, and he asked again. The man said that Randolph explained everything to him. The cobblestones were just great, so the family could no longer worry about mud during the rain. Kane thanked his father for the compliment and thought that it was great, because now he would be able to practice earth magic more openly. Lord St. Rose continued and said that after his son completes the road to the mansion, then it will be possible. The man did not finish and was afraid that it would be too much. The butler asked why the gentleman should not share his thoughts with all of them. A blonde man with a neat beard and informal clothes agreed, but warned that it was a pretty crazy plan. Kane was too interested in what the man had come up with, so he asked his father to tell him. The man said that he wanted the main street of their city to be paved with cobblestones in two months. Kane was very surprised and delighted. He calculated that the length of the street was a whole kilometer, and the width was seven meters. Therefore, working with two people, such work would take a year. The Lord added that the budget for this project would be 200 gold pieces. The captured son wondered what was coming in two months. The father took hold of his head and realized that his plan was unrealistic anyway, so there would be enough road to the mansion. The Lord decided to stop there. Inspired by Cain at that moment, he thought that one road to the mansion would not be enough at all. It was a great opportunity. Building the main road is a big deal. The boy screamed that he would do it. The amazed man asked again, but the boy asked him not to worry, because he was sure that they would cope if they had more people. Cain promised to come up with another plan so that they would finish the job as soon as possible. The Lord remained silent for a while and agreed to his son's proposal. He said that at that time he was leaving this job to the boy and asked him not to overdo it. Cain went out the door and walked down the corridor. He was thinking that he had been entrusted with such an important task, so he decided to start right away. In the study, the boy's father told the butler Randolph that he would need his help. The restrained man replied that he would do everything as the master ordered. The next day, Cain began to feel pressure. He thought that they had enough money and a lot of people, but he still didn't know if he would succeed. The boy felt weak in his body, now he had a meeting. Cain opened the door and saw his sister Alice, who studied in the library with the governess. The boy was scared because he realized that today was the day of classes and they continued for several more days. Alice showed the teacher with short black hair and glasses the task she had completed on the accounts. The girl said that everything was correct and added that the girl had become better able to understand arithmetic since she started using the abacus. Kane watched his sister's progress, standing silently in the doorway. He was happy when his magic gave someone a smile and wanted other people to be happy too. Cain cheered himself up, thinking that now was not the time to be discouraged and he would succeed. The boy entered a room with large windows and a rectangular wooden table. The butler was sitting on one side of the table and Hardy on the other. Cain greeted them both once more and entered. He explained to Randolph yesterday's work, drew a diagram. Hardy told him what was difficult about it then. They discussed how to lay out the road smoothly and everything like that. Randolph summed up everything he heard and came to the conclusion that it would be difficult to finish the plan in two months without involving many people. The construction was based on the magic of Cain, which accounted for more than 70% of the work. The load was huge, but the boy shouted that he could handle it because it was difficult to put the stones in a row, and from the point of view of magic, everything was not so difficult. Randolph decided to reread and study the plan again. Hardy turned to Mr. Kane and said that he was very well versed in magic, but the boy made stones with magic and with its help turned the soil into mud, and then they laid out the road. The dark-haired man asked if it was possible to turn the soil into stone immediately with the help of magic. From what he heard, Kane opened his mouth and slapped the table, telling Hardy that it was a great idea. In the first place, magic was an image, so if there is a good image, then using magic everything can work out. 
The boy praised the man, which made him scratch his head in embarrassment. Kane jumped up from his chair and ran towards the door, calling the men to try everything right now. First they had to go outside and practice. The boy added that it was better to make a mistake now than later. All the young people went outside, and the blonde-haired Kane explained that they would first practice in a small area and gradually increase the size. He asked Hardy to draw a couple of squares meter by meter. The man immediately agreed and got to work. Meanwhile, the young construction magician himself was preparing his magic. He cupped his hands and tuned into the magic of circulation. With a distance of 10 millimeters between the stones, Kane needed to lay out 80 stones, which meant that they circulated about a hundred magical forces, leaving room for control. Kane concentrated and thought that he had never controlled so much magic at the same time, so his control could soon run out. He repeated the word concentration to himself several times. The boy realized that it was time and he sat down and put his palms to the ground. He screamed, calling for the stone to appear. A road of stones of the same size began to appear in front of Kane and the two amazed men. Looking at the result, the young man said that he still managed to turn the earth into stone, but because of this he was pretty tired. The butler leaned over to the boy and praised Mr. Kane for doing a great job for the first time. The boy thought about it and crossed his arms. He noticed that the stones were uneven and the blockage between them was uneven, which made everything look ugly. Kane stared at the track and thought deeply, because he didn't even know how to fix it. Randolph held a piece of paper with a plan in his hands and shared his thoughts on what lines could be drawn to make it easier to imagine. Hardy drew smooth little squares on the untouched ground nearby and tried again. Young Mr. Kane touched the ground with his palms and invoked the magic of the stone. This time, the stones appeared exactly where they should be. The boy thought that maybe this happened because it was easier for him to visualize the result when there were lines. Where the lines were drawn crookedly, the stones did not line up neatly and distorted. Kane thought about it, and Hardy was a little scared, because he didn't have magic and didn't know anything about it. The man had several friends who used magic, they all worked the same magic, causing the same phenomena. Everything was the same for them, but none of them could modify magic the way Mr. Kane did. The boy suggested using the board as a ruler and drawing a straight line. The Lord's son found a suitable board and put it on the ground. Hardy took a stick and began to draw a line on the blackboard, thinking that in any situation the boy showed ingenuity and imagination, because that was the only way to find a new path. The man looked at the pleased boy and thought that he was really an amazing person. Kane sat down and said that they would try a third time. He invoked the magic of stone and a perfect smooth paved path appeared in front of him. Lord St. Rose and the butler were walking along the corridor of the mansion. Mr. St. Rose asked if they really had already completed the road to the mansion. Randolph confirmed his words and said that they were in the process of being completed and would like to show him Mr. Kane in action. The men went out onto the porch of the mansion, and the boy greeted his father. He and Hardy were drawing lines for the final part of the road. The Lord stood up, his mouth hanging open. His son did not let him say anything and explained that now they would turn this place into a stone pavement, so he asked his father to look at it. Cain invoked the magic of the stone three times, he succeeded, and the road to the mansion was completed. Cain threw up his hands in joy and shouted that they had learned. The butler noted that Mr. Cain might be able to carry out such a crazy plan of his father. Cain and Hardy high-fived each other. Now it's the turn of paving the main street. Randolph, Hardy, Cain and Alice arrived in the capital. They walked down the street, and the astonished townspeople stared at them with their mouths open. Alice took her brother's hand and asked him to hold on to it, because it was easy to get lost on the main street of the city. The young people came there to inspect the paving of the main street. The boy thought about the fact that they had to go three together with Hardy and Randolph. At that moment, his sister screamed that Kane was cheating. When they were going on a trip to the mansion, Alice went into Lord St. Rose's office and informed everyone that she was also going to the main street. Lord St. Rose asked his daughter if she had been eavesdropping on them. The girl yelled at her father and said that it was unfair that only Kane could visit the city, and she sat in her room every day and studied. The father of the family waved his hands and said that his daughter could go with them. Alice was dragging her brother by the hand, and at that time he was thinking that he was sorry that his father could not marry his sister to her husband. The guys were passing by a market where there were all kinds of vegetables and fruits, and a dog was lying at the counter. The young builder held his nose and thought that it smelled of waste mixed with food. Although everyone behaved quite naturally, the smell seemed strange to him. The boy turned to the butler and asked if the width of the main road was about 7 meters. Randolph said that the approximate width was the same, but with each turn to the castle gate it became wider, 
and eventually it becomes 8 meters. The narrowing of the road as it moved away from the gate had two meanings. It slowed down the attacker's progress and made it easier to get to the gate. The man with the mustache added that the main street sloped smoothly down to the gate and its length was about 1 kilometer. Kane confirmed this and noted that the path was quite long. The boy raised his hand to his chin and thought deeply about the fact that the road was so wide that it could not be completed in a day or two, and its complete closure would interfere with the lives of local residents, so it could not be the same as the road in front of the estate. Kane decided to think about it at home and drew attention to his sister, who was looking at the goods on the counter of a cute merchant. The boy raised his index finger and offered to make a model of this city. Darty was surprised and asked if he needed this model for the project. Kane explained that the layout was simply necessary because there was a big difference between looking from the spot and from the side. The guy asked Randolph if he had an accurate map or diagram of the main road and if the butler could introduce him to someone who understood the layout of the city. The man understood everything and said that he would return to the estate and make some adjustments, and then call someone from the authorities. Kane was very pleased and thanked Randolph, but for now he decided that he had to take a good look at the city. The boy and Hardy toured the city and talked with residents and sellers. When they were done, Randolph brought a carriage and drove the boys back to the manor. The boy thanked him for picking them up, because it was hard to walk all the way back. The butler replied to the young master that there was no problem and added that one responsible person would be here soon. A young girl in a jacket and skirt with long blonde hair pulled back in a ponytail came up to Kane and said that it was nice to meet her. The girl's name was Noel. She was the head of the maintenance department. Noel bowed slightly as a sign of acquaintance and smiled. Kane greeted her back, but Hardy just opened his eyes wide and stared at the pretty girl with his mouth open. Randolph invited the young people to go into the conference room, and the gardener was still standing with his mouth open. Kane turned to the man and asked if he could do him a favor. Hardy did not immediately respond and apologized, explaining that he was thinking about something of his own. Everyone went to the conference room, and Alice left because she had an appointment with Mother Lydia. The butler and the head of the maintenance department were sitting at a rectangular wooden table. Mr. Kane bowed and said that he was looking forward to working with them today. Randolph called the boy and whispered in his ear that since he was the son of a nobleman, he should not bow to his vassals. Kane asked Noel if she had brought a map and measurements. The girl confirmed it and began to arrange the sheets from the stack on the table. She said that if you put all these regulations in a row, you will get a map of the capital. After seeing the final result on the table, Kane said that the card turned out to be a little too big, so he asked if Noel had the same one but half the size. The girl explained that she had several of them, but then they would not be so accurate. The boy thought that when they would make the model, they should make it twice as small, because the map was too big to look at. Kane decided that he needed to look at the map carefully. The young man turned around and saw a dark-haired guardy, who, along with another subordinate, was carrying sticks on which hung an awning with a large pile of earth. The guy explained to Mr. Kane that they had brought a large amount of soil, as he had requested. The men lowered the ground and asked if there was enough. The boy replied to Hardy that it was perfect. Noel asked Hardy what Mr. Kane was going to do with the soil. The man explained that he was sure that the boy would do something incredible again. Kane clasped his hands and said that he wanted to make a model based on the map. First he had to concentrate and present the model according to the map data and then. The boy put his palms on the ground and used the clay creation magic. The soil began to change and soon turned into an accurate clay model of a city with houses, roads and a mansion surrounded by a fortress with towers. All the witnesses to the use of magic were very surprised. The city on the layout was depicted in three planes. Hardy said that it was amazing, as expected from Mr. Kane. It was a very convenient way to understand the city at a glance. Noel leaned over to the boy and said that it was incredible. She wondered how this was possible because he studied the map for only a few hours and then recreated the whole city from clay. Kane sat down to the layout and explained that the places he had not had time to explore today, he had created with the help of imagination, so they were not very good. Randolph thought that, given the boy's capabilities now, this opportunity could also be used to create a siege tactic for the city, so it would be a big problem if other houses or the royal family found out about it. Kane asked the young people if they could move the model to his desk, because he was sure that it would be more convenient to look at it that way. The butler watched the boy and thought about what he said about the work done as a trifle. The man with the mustache and neatly arranged gray hair was lost in thought. He thought that depending on how to use Mr. Kane's abilities, he could do both good and evil, so they had to keep a close eye on the boy so that bad people would not use him in the future. The young people carefully examined the clay model. 
Kane pointed his finger at the tiny town and said that if you look from the other side, the main street sloped smoothly down to the gate, so if they built a ditch, it would prevent the accumulation of water. Noel asked the boy what a ditch was. The young builder explained that ditches are ditches that are built at the edge of the road so that rain and other water entering the road flows into the ditch and does not accumulate in puddles. Kane added that he learned about it from a book. The girl replied that he knew a lot, and the boy thought that he still had a lot to learn. Hardy asked the young gentleman what he planned to do with the water that would drain into the ditch. Kane thought that usually this water was drained into the sewer, but there were no such technologies in this city, so he asked Noel how the city's wastewater is being treated now. The girl thought about it and said that she thought that currently the city's sewage is simply being flushed out of the house. The boy was very surprised by what he heard and opened his eyes wide. He thought that it was a very unhygienic way of cleaning, so it was surprising that these waters did not spread an epidemic or something like that. Kane understood why it smelled so bad when he walked around the city. The head of the maintenance department explained that in big cities there were places where sewage was treated with slime. The rest of the estate workers exclaimed when they heard about the slime, and Kane was the only one who did not understand what was being discussed, so he asked Noel what slime cleaning was. The girl said that cleaning with slime is a method of diverting water outside the city walls and storing it in a tank, which is then automatically cleaned with slime. When the slime finds garbage or dirty water, it appears and cleans everything. So to be precise, they absorb and dissolve all substances except water. Kane replied that he did not know that there was such a way, and at that moment he thought that the other world was so cool. The boy had never heard of this before. In a world where there is no sewer, mucus cleansing can blow the best way. Kane turned to Randolph the butler and explained that he would like to bring this to their city, so he asked the man if he could make a hole leading outside the city walls, because they would not be able to put slime inside the walls. The butler replied that it all depends on how the boy wanted to build. He added that he thought that it could be done if it did not affect the defense, because after all, there was no such precedent yet. Kane thought for a while and asked at what distance from the walls is it safe to build a reservoir. He assumed that about one kilometer. Noel fit into the conversation and noted that it was not necessary to make it that far, because slugs themselves were weak demons, so if too many of them gathered, low-ranking adventurers would exterminate them. Kane understood everything and thought that he was a little sorry that they would have to exterminate slugs for convenience. But after all, in this world it was normal. The boy decided that if he integrated the existing systems of this world into his knowledge from his previous life, he would get a very good city. The young construction worker looked at the table with the layout and said that they had sorted it out, so they would continue to work according to plan. All the other participants of the project stood around the table and happily agreed. As a result of their discussions, they settled on the following drainage method, the method of drainage of rainwater, and the construction of sewage treatment ponds. On both sides of the road, they will make ditches with a diameter of about 30 centimeters, in which holes will be drilled every few meters to collect rainwater. The ditches go underground about 20 meters before the castle gate and go beyond it. While the ditches are sinking into the ground, a sewage treatment tank is being built 300 meters away from them, in which the land is being cleaned. The father of the St. Rose family joined the construction process. Kane saw that Alice had drawn a bird, but the girl screamed that it was a wolf and asked what was wrong with her brother's eyes. Lady Lydia asked her son what kind of stone design he would be able to make. Kane replied that, in principle, he could do anything, as long as there were not too many gaps. He asked Mother Lydia and Sister Alice to design the cobblestones. Kane thought the project would go more smoothly if he got them to work. The girls decided to add drawings on some cobblestones to make them visually pleasing. Mother St. Rose asked to be given a few days to think about everything. Kane thought that Alice's paintings were a bit avant-garde, and besides, he planned to block the main road for traffic for half an hour at lunch and for half an hour in the evening. The reason was that it would be easier for people to organize if the road was closed for only half an hour. The boy had to do the job quickly so as not to interfere with everyone's life. He concentrated and put his palms on the ground, using the magic of circulation. Each employee of the estate began to carry out the instructions of the young magician builder. Hardy finished drawing the first line on the road, and Kane touched the ground with his palms again. Kane shouted the word stone and a perfect road of smooth rectangular cobblestones appeared between the crowds of workers. The townspeople and workers shouted that it was great, and some wondered what it was. Encouraged, Kane St. Rose asked his friend Hardy if they would continue. The dark-haired man with a stick over his shoulder agreed, and Kane repeated the same procedure again. He crouched down to the ground and used the stone magic again. 
Randolph, the butler, approached the boy and politely informed him that it had been almost 30 minutes. The boy was surprised at how quickly time flew by. Kane stood up and exhaled. He informed the men that he was tired. The residents of the city came to a new road. A girl in a white apron said that it was easy to walk along this path, and a blonde young man in a hat added that thanks to this road they would not get dirty during the rain. Residents stared at the road in amazement, and the builders, along with the butler, went on. Kane thought that it was great, because the townspeople liked it. The boy raised his fist and told his assistants that they would still work in the evening. This is how the work on the paving project progressed. At the same time drainage work continued. Lady Lydia and Alice have finally decided on the design of the cobblestones. Kane shouted the word stone and a perfect road of smooth rectangular cobblestones appeared between the crowds of workers. The townspeople and workers shouted that it was great, and some wondered what it was. Encouraged, Kane St. Rose asked his friend Hardy if they would continue. The dark-haired man with a stick over his shoulder agreed, and Kane repeated the same procedure again. He crouched down to the ground and used the stone magic again. Randolph, the butler, approached the boy and politely informed him that it had been almost 30 minutes. The boy was surprised at how quickly time flew by. Kane stood up and exhaled. He informed the men that he was tired. The residents of the city came to a new road. A girl in a white apron said that it was easy to walk along this path, and a blonde young man in a hat added that thanks to this road they would not get dirty during the rain. Residents stared at the road in amazement, and the builders, along with the butler, went on. Kane thought that it was great, because the townspeople liked it. The boy raised his fist and told his assistants that they would still work in the evening. This is how the work on the paving project progressed. At the same time drainage work continued. Lady Lydia and Alice have finally decided on the design of the cobblestones. It was decided to use the entire width of the road every hundred meters to create cobblestone pavements lined with floral ornaments. Lilies, sunflowers, jinko leaves, maples, thanks to all this, the road will look very festive. The townspeople approached Mr. Kane and thanked him once again for his work. Two women from the city discussed that since Kane worked so hard, they had to keep up with him. The girls really liked the new road. The boy, engaged in the magical construction of the road, listened to their conversations and smiled. Other children ran up to him, they really wanted to see magic. Kane touched the ground with his palms and used stone magic. Looking at this, the city children also decided to try and put their palms on the ground, pronouncing the word stone. But of course they did not succeed. Kane waved to a woman in a white dress and a small dark-haired girl. Another elderly woman came up to the young builders with a basket. She asked if they would like to taste her homemade meat on skewers. The young people thanked the old woman, and Randolph thought that it was wonderful, because thanks to Mr. Kane and his construction work, they got to know the mood of the city better. Kane took one wooden skewer with meat and tasted it. A month and a half later, everything was finally ready. Kane was sitting at the castle walls by the ground, finishing the final part of the cobblestone road. The butler, Hardy, and the head of the maintenance department stood around the boy. The boy magician stood up to evaluate the work done and was very happy. The road with floral ornaments sparkled. The townspeople rejoiced and gasped. A man in a cap approached the Lord's son. He squeezed his small hands and said that it would be easier for them to trade now, after which he thanked the boy. An elderly citizen noted that it was a great surprise for his old age. The girl joyfully scattered flower petals. Everyone around loudly thanked the boy. He smiled and thought that maybe he wasn't the chosen hero, but he was happy because people were happy because of his magic. Kane came to the conclusion that he was glad that he got the magic of the earth. Lord St. Rose watched the city from the window of his estate. He told the blonde servant that it was finally over. People looked so happy and it was great. The man had never seen paved streets in the capital. He suggested that maybe now people would start talking about it all over the country and people would start coming from other lands. The workers, along with Kane, Hardy and Randolph, walked along the brand new street, followed by joyful townspeople and supported them. The father of the St. Rose family opened the door to the room and loudly announced, asking everyone to pay attention because his father-in-law was coming to check. The butler was standing behind the man. The unexpected appearance of the Lord took his family by surprise. Lady Lydia and the children were playing cards and were very surprised. The border Earl Shields with a blonde beard and glasses from a neighboring fiefdom was Lydia's father. For Luke he became a relative by coincidence. Cain thought that he had also met the Count when he was a couple of years old, but he did not remember him at all, because he was too young then. The boy did not think that his grandfather and his father had a good relationship. Luke St. Rose clutched his head. He was sweating and the vein on his temple was swollen. The man explained that his father-in-law was a very strict man. 
Lydia said that nevertheless, her father's visit was a complete surprise. Luke assumed that he had probably heard rumors about the paved street, so it was very nice of him to come. But still, Cain interrupted his father and asked what was going on about the Count's reception. The man replied to his son that this was the case, because the House of St. Rose did not have such a specialization. But it did not matter, because they would ask the knights to hunt monsters in the area, and prepare demon meat for the reception. Cain tensed and thought that his father should not have been so self-confident. Lydia added that there was no need to try so hard, because the paved streets were quite enough. Alice thought about it and said that it would be great if they had a good meal to treat Grandpa to. Cain searched through his memories and came to the conclusion that the food on the territory of St. Rose looked simple. The boy thought about the fact that in his previous life he ate mostly store-bought food, so he didn't mind it all at home. Now the Lord's family needed a special kitchen. Cain remembered his hero's book. He was sure that it talked about cultivation and seasonings. The boy turned to his father and mother and offered to serve a delicious dish from the hero's book at the reception. He assumed that his grandfather did not know anything about it, so he would be surprised. The parents did not give an answer immediately, so Cain thought that something was wrong. The Lord replied that it was a great idea, and the mother was surprised and asked her son if he could still read this book. The parents looked at each other in puzzlement, and the boy clutched his head and screamed to himself, remembering that he was hiding the fact that he could read the hero's book, but was still glad that his parents were satisfied with his proposal. Luke thought about it and told his son that since he could read the book of the hero, it was not surprising that he knew about the use of abacus and the structure of the cobblestone pavement. Cain awkwardly scratched his head and thought that this was actually knowledge from his past life, but he wasn't going to tell his parents about it. Lucas St. Rose held out his hand and loudly said that in any case, time was running out, so it was time to start already. Cain announced that he would bring the hero's book and ran. The Lord instructed the butler Randolph to call the chef. The restrained man understood everything and went on an errand. In front of the Lord and his family stood a young, long-haired man in chef's clothes. He scratched his head and asked if he should have checked if there were spices that Mr. Cain would name. The boy confirmed and added that he wanted to make sure that he was familiar with the seasonings they would be working with. The chef understood everything. This time, Cain received special permission to bring the book. Having checked all the necessary seasonings and ingredients in this way, as the boy thought, there were things in the book that existed in his former world, but not in this one. The new world had mayonnaise and soy sauce, but there was no ketchup, Worcestershire sauce, miso soy paste and mirin, sweet rice wine for cooking. Cain thought that it was good that there was soy sauce in this world. Of the ingredients, this world was familiar with potatoes, tomatoes, they were onions and gari, garlic. The boy was glad that there were potatoes here, which he missed the most. Milk was available, but not usable. Other unavailable ingredients were goat's butter and milk. The cook explained to the boy that goat's oil was quite difficult to get. In this world, there were earth-like types of meat, so it was possible to use them as an alternative. A wild bull was used instead of beef, an orc replaced pork, and a horned chicken replaced chicken. Cain wondered why the names of the spices and ingredients sounded so similar, for example, potatoes. The chef asked if there was anything else the boy would like to ask him. Cain confirmed and added that he had one last question. The boy was writing something down with a pen on a piece of paper. He showed it to the man in the apron and asked if there were dishes in this memo that Chef Lloyd knew about. On the sheet was a list of seven dishes, salad with potatoes, ham and mayonnaise, salad with pasta, ham, onion and mayonnaise, meat dishes based on bovine or orc meat, chopped, rolled and grilled, orc meat wrapped in thin bread and fried in oil, horned chicken, seasoned salt and potatoes, sprinkled with flour and deep fried in oil, an omelet of horned chicken with eggs and sugar, as well as a meat dish made from chicken with horns. Lloyd studied the list and thought about it. He replied that he did not think he had heard or eaten anything like that except for the first, second and third courses. A dark-haired man with long hair asked Randolph if he had heard of these dishes. The butler replied that it reminded him of meat dishes made from meat scraps, but they were distinguished by their boldness. Everyone in the room was thinking hard. The Lord suddenly asked, why don't they cook everything from the list? Because they had to try before judging. Lydia asked, was it possible? Her husband answered her and asked why not. Cain thought that his father was right, because you never know what you're going to cook until you try it. Chef Lloyd took a close look at the list and replied that he didn't know if he could do it. The boy stared at the man and also asked him. He plaintively said that the chef was his only hope. The boy's eyes got a little wet. Lloyd said that if he kept looking at him and asking in that voice, then he would. The man did not finish the previous thought and agreed. He added that maybe you wouldn't tell from him, but he had been a chef for many years for a reason. 
Lloyd put his hand on his chest and invited everyone to do it. The St. Rose family was very pleased with the man's words. Chef Lloyd managed to collect all the ingredients. He prepared all possible dishes by trial and error. Kane constantly tried to look into the kitchen, but the butler politely kicked him out, saying that it was unsafe there. A few days later, the chef gathered the family to taste the resulting dishes. He dragged two trolleys with iron domes to the table with a tablecloth. Lloyd thanked everyone for their patience and informed them that they had finally finished cooking the dishes from the hero's book. The man asked the family members to enjoy them and put everything on the table. There were lots of salads and a variety of meats. The family of Lord St. Rose opened their mouths at what they saw. Lydia said that she had never seen such food, and the children added that it smelled very tasty. Lucas suggested that we try it first. Alice put meat on her plate and said that it was her favorite. The girl wished everyone a pleasant appetite and put a fork in her mouth. Suddenly, the Lord's daughter opened her eyes wide and screamed that she had never eaten such a meat dish and it was delicious. Lady Lydia took a plate of egg roll and noted its unusual shape. The girl tasted a piece and was surprised that it was really an egg, because it turned out to be very voluminous. Lord Lucas cut the meat in a crispy breading and noted its crispy texture, and that the meat was mouth-watering and delicious. Kane sat and thought about what he knew, because homemade food from a previous life looked like a feast here. A cook in a white hat was watching the tasting. The happy boy said that now they could treat their grandfather. The boy thanked Chef Lloyd, to which the man replied that it was a great honor for him. Kane rewrote the previous menu, changing the names of the dishes to potato salad, pasta salad, pork cutlet, carriage, and omelet. The boy held out a menu sheet and said that it was what he called the recipes of the heroes. All family members and subjects applauded Kane. In his castle, the border Earl Shields thought that he had not seen Lydia and her husband for a long time. He had heard that their territory had become known as the Land of Cobblestones. In his own country, this could only be seen in the capital, so the man with the blonde beard wondered how they did it. He wanted to find out their secret for the development of his lands. The Count smiled ominously. A man with a long beard and glasses was preparing for his daughter's arrival in the country. The St. Rose family was standing at the door of the mansion, waiting for a guest. The day of grandfather's arrival has finally arrived. Kane thought about how he couldn't even count how many times the chefs had improved the dishes and fed them to him over the past month. Fried eggs were served three times in a row. Lord Lucas announced that the guest had arrived. A carriage passed by the mansion, and several knights in armor got out of it. The long-awaited Earl Shields appeared between the knights. His expression was very serious and tense. The Lord thanked the guests for coming to them from afar today. The stern man with glasses did not answer and stared at the children. Suddenly, he smiled very sweetly and said how they had grown up, and Kane had already become such a big boy. The man asked Alice if she would go to school soon, because now she has become a real lady. The girl was delighted and bowed to her grandfather. She said that they had not seen each other for a long time and everyone was looking forward to meeting him. Kane was surprised at how quickly his sister greeted the man. The boy quickly realized that he should have greeted him properly too, and bowed, calling his grandfather the Lord of the Frontier. Kane added that he was already six years old. The man was a little upset and asked if the boy did not call him the same as Alice, grandfather. Kane was very scared and began to deny. He realized that he must have been treated incorrectly. The man with the beard replied that he missed it so much. Lady Lydia tensed up a little and rebuked her father for his jokes, because Kane didn't even know what to do. The Count laughed and apologized several times. Still laughing, he asked Luke if he had lost weight. Lord St. Rose replied that, fortunately, he was in excellent physical shape and thanked his father-in-law for his concern. He called a guest with a cane to go into the manor. Kane was surprised, because he thought that Grandpa would be scarier. A blonde, bearded man with glasses sat down in an armchair in front of a cup of tea. He apologized for disturbing them with his visit and explained that the merchants who come here talk so much about the beautiful streets of this city that he wanted to see them with his own eyes. Luke replied that it was an honor for him. The grandfather added that he had not seen Lydia for a long time and asked his daughter how her health was. The girl replied that everything was fine, as he saw. The Count said that his daughter was becoming more and more like her mother Aisha. He felt a great feeling when she was both here and at home. Lydia asked her father if everything was okay with her mother because she thought that she would also come with him today. Earl Shields explained that this was originally the plan, but she had recently injured her leg so she had to stay. Lydia was scared and asked if everything was okay with her mother and what happened. Her father calmed her down and asked her not to worry. Because there was nothing serious, she just fell while tending the garden at the villa, so there was no reason to worry. Lydia understood everything and added that she would visit them again soon. 
The bearded man laughed and said that would be great. He took a sip of tea and said that now they would get down to business. The man said that the road from the city to the villa was beautiful. He was once again amazed at how different things are to see and hear about something. As soon as the road became paved, the vibrations decreased and the speed of the carriages increased. Besides, the different colors of the road made it easier for the carriages to move, so the street looked just great. The Lord thanked the man for the compliment and explained that they had indeed reduced the number of accidents between carriages and carts, since they had determined where the transport was going according to different colors. Luke added that the cobblestone design was Alice and Lydia's idea. The girls smiled sheepishly. The father of the family went on to say that since the cobblestones were very easy to clean, the locals gathered themselves and washed them. The Count was surprised and scratched his blonde beard. Cain mentally confirmed his father's words and thought that perhaps, thanks to the effect of the cobblestone pavement, the number of volunteers who cleaned the streets every day, especially at the shops on the main road, had increased. The boy had heard that because of this, garbage was previously taken out even during the daytime. But now there was a completely different situation. The young man was grateful to the residents, but he was wondering why they started cleaning. He thought that people wanted to save the cobblestones, because they were so beautiful. It was true. People in the city said that they could not allow the cobblestones that Mr. Kane worked so hard on to get dirty, so they collected garbage on their own. The elderly count realized what the effect of the road was and stared into a cup of tea. He scratched his beard once more and added that he would like their city to be paved with cobblestones too. All the family members understood why he had come. Kane thought that in the end, Grandfather had come here for exactly this. His words might seem like a simple request from an old man. But it was a completely different matter when it was a conversation between Lord and Lord. If in this case you say the wrong thing, then you will have to pay. And you were talking to the Count of the Frontier who was also your father-in-law, so in this case you had to be as delicate as possible. Cain was worried about his father. Lord Luke said that if a man asked him to do this, then he would do everything possible to fulfill his request. The lords looked at each other, and Grandpa replied that if they were as good as they were here, then he would agree. The father of the family said that, of course, they would be just as good. The blonde lord asked Randolph's butler to bring it here. The man obeyed and left. Cain thought that it looked like everything had worked out as it should, because after all, they were a family. Luke clutched his head and said that he knew he would have to do this for free. The butler calmed him down. Randolph brought a clay model of the city into the room and the count sat down opposite him. The man was handed a piece of paper with instructions and details, where it was said that before laying the cobblestones, they first made such a model, the project budget was 500 gold coins. Kane thought about the fact that the budget was 25 times more than he spent on the project, so he wondered what would happen now. The bearded count put down the piece of paper and said that everything was clear to him and the details were clear. He added that he would like to order it immediately. Grandfather's words surprised all the family members. The strict count noticed the surprise and asked what was the matter and if there were any problems. The Lord replied with lightning speed that there were no problems and, of course, they would be engaged in construction in the near future. The boy was thinking that something like bargaining usually took place and he did not expect to be asked to do it without any negotiations. Cain understood what the power of the frontier lord was because he could afford anything he wanted. The Count reported that the more he looked at the model, the more amazed he became, so he asked who did it anyway. Cain thought about his grandfather's words and realized that, given how much information he had received, such a question was asking itself. The boy's father said that Cain did it with the help of earth magicians. The young man was smiling, and the bearded Count asked again and said that it was just amazing. Luke offered to discuss the details after dinner, to which his father-in-law replied that they really didn't need to rush. Lydia happily told her father that they had prepared a room for him, so she asked why he should not rest there for now, and she would show him everything around. The man agreed and thanked him. The Count and his daughter went up to the guest room, and the girl asked him not to be too strict with Luke. The man laughed and apologized, explaining that he had not teased him for a long time. The bearded man noted that they seemed to have worked hard. Lydia said that he saw everything for himself, they worked hard as a family. The Count replied that he was glad that they got along so well, and he was pleased to see Luke growing as a person. The man suddenly stopped and told his daughter that this model of the city was dangerous. He asked if anyone else knew about the details. Lydia assured him that only he knew about it and they imposed a ban on everyone in their house. The man with glasses tensed up and said that it was more than just a model of the city, so they should be on their guard. The daughter also tensed up and replied to her father that she understood this and thanked him for his care. 
Now the man decided to ask what they had for dinner today, because the last time was wonderful. The father and daughter laughed, and the girl said that everything was fine and they had a special dinner planned today. She explained that today's menu is the revived recipes of the hero. The count was surprised and loudly asked if they cooked according to the recipe of the hero. The girl confirmed and said that she would tell you about everything after dinner. The Count of the Frontier was sitting in front of a plate with a variety of dishes. He realized what the food from the hero's book was and decided to start with this dish. The bearded man carefully cut the meat and tasted a little. At this time, the whole family, along with the chef, stared at him, waiting for a reaction. Suddenly, the man opened his eyes wide and asked what it was, because it was delicious, very tasty. Kane explained that this egg dish was just amazing. It was called an omelette. Luke St. Rose told his father-in-law that if he wished, he could give him today's recipe and added that he would like Aisha to try it too. The Count was surprised and thanked the man, saying that Aisha would be delighted. Kane and the chef were very pleased that the recipes were successful. As a result, Grandpa ate three more plates of egg rolls, and the story of the cobblestone pavement developed as usual. The next day, Grandpa announced that he needed Kane and the others to stay with him for a few months if they wanted to do work. Did the man specify if this was normal? Lydia replied to her father that everything was fine and she had already informed Kane and would accompany them in such a case. The Count replied that he was pleased with this and added that many adjustments had to be made, so he asked to wait until the new year. He also explained that other conditions need to be discussed with civil officials, and they will talk about the results when the family and the workers arrive on his territory. Lydia understood everything, and the man told Kane that he was counting on him and winked strangely. The boy, a little scared of the responsibility assigned to him, loudly confirmed his grandfather's words. The Count's carriage drove out of the gates of the St. Rose family mansion and all its members immediately breathed a sigh of relief. Luke told his wife that he still managed to talk without rudeness, for which Lydia thanked him. Kane rubbed his eyes and thought that his grandfather was a very heavy man. The boy felt drowsy from all this tension. He understood that he needed to practice more magic so that he could smoothly implement the cobblestone project. So far, the boy has decided that he needs to take a break and jumped on the bed, thinking that sleep is the best medicine. Some time after his grandfather's departure, Kane walked through the corridors of the mansion and thought that he should have turned to the archives again. The boy has been busy with repairs and hospitality for the last few days, so he completely forgot to read the hero's book. Kyan, opening the door to the library, thought that now that he had a free minute, it would be nice to do this, because there was probably something about the local magic. The boy entered the room and saw his mother, who was reading a letter, and the maids were jumping joyfully next to her. Lydia was surprised to see her son and said that when you enter a room, you need to knock. The boy apologized, and the lady asked him to be more attentive next time. Kane asked mother Lydia if anything good had happened. The blonde girl laughed and asked her son if he had already understood this. She explained that she had received a letter saying that everyone would come home for the new year this year. A letter was sent to her from Arthur's eldest son, informing her that all three of them, Arthur, Benjamin and Chris, would celebrate the new year at their house. Kane took the letter and thought about the fact that the brothers Arthur and Chris were returning home, and he hardly remembers them, because when he saw them last, he was still a little boy. The boy was pleased that all four brothers would finally get together. Lady St. Rose said that rumors had reached the capital about their paved streets. This was also mentioned in the letter, she thought it was just wonderful. The mother patted her son on the head and he laughed. Kane asked his mother how long it had been since all the brothers had been together. Lydia replied that she needed to think about it and came to the conclusion that Chris had not returned since he entered the academy. About three years had passed since that moment, so she was looking forward to it. The woman in the beautiful dress added that she would have to ask Chef Lloyd to cook something else delicious. The boy thought that it was very nice. Now he understood why his father fell in love with his mother, because she was so sincere. The happy boy replied that he was also looking forward to the meeting. Kane went to the library and thought that he was looking forward to the day when all the brothers would return. But for now he decided to continue reading the book of the hero. The boy opened the book and began flipping through the pages, trying to remember where he left off. Suddenly he noticed that the pages were stuck together at the end and, separating them, he saw a secret compartment in which round glasses were lying. The boy took the glasses and was very surprised. He wondered what it was and how he didn't notice them at all. The glasses were very small, and the boy didn't even know how to use them. Kane took the small glasses in his hands, and they instantly increased. He thought that it was amazing, because they took the perfect size for him. The young magician wondered if the glasses had the magic of sizing up. He decided to try them on and see. Suddenly a magic board with various symbols appeared in front of the boy. 
The board thanked the boy for using this artifact and promised to show him how to use the glasses. It was further said that, as you noticed, the glasses enchanted with increase and decrease spells. They were small when not in use, and the right size when used. Kane thought that he was right in his assumption, and it was these glasses that allowed the use of the analysis skill. It was written on the magic board that when you place an object that you want to analyze in the field of view and focus on it, a window will open in front of you, similar to the one in which the results of the analysis of the object are displayed. An inscription signed by a certain hero also appeared on the board, which said that he hoped that the glasses would be useful. Kane was glad that he could now use the analysis and mentally thank the hero. The young man remembered that he had magic, which required an analysis skill. Previously, he wondered where to get the analysis skill, which was a prerequisite for many letters, but because of its absence, he decided that he could not do anything at the first level. The boy with glasses decided to check now and open the status on the magic board. It said that at the skill level, one magic can be developed into magical components and recorded on scrolls, magic stones, and so on. An advanced skill that requires a separate skill is analysis for parsing magic into magical formations. To write disassembled magic into a scroll or magic stone requires 10 times more magic than disassembled magic consumes. To use written magic requires 3 times more magic power than analyzed magic. Kane drew attention to the words about an advanced skill that requires a separate skill to parse magic into magical formations. Kane was sitting in the library wearing magic glasses. He was glad that he knew that he could use the analysis skill to find out everything. He thought about being able to use the magic formation he had given up. The young man decided to see what skills could be used at the first level of magic. On the magic board, it was said about creating magic ink, creating ink to create and draw a magic circle. This required magic. 30. A conscious magic circle converts the analyzed magic into a magic circle and creates it. Magic 50 was required to transfer a previously created magic circle to an object. And for magic equal to 100, there was no spells, it was only necessary to pronounce the name of the magic and imagine the effect and use it. As a result, it turned out that the procedure consisted of several points, creating magic ink, analyzing magic, creating a circle and transferring a magic circle. Kane wondered if he should have started creating ink. The boy looked at his hands and imagined that he had a bottle of ink in his palm. He directed magic at it. A moment later, a jar of beautiful blue color actually appeared in the boy's hands, from which ink flowed. Such things delighted Kane. Next, he decided to create a magic circle but first he needed to analyze its magic. The boy thought that it was possible to analyze magic right now, but it didn't work out. Kane got nervous and started shaking his hands. He realized that minus one meant zero, so it was practically unusable. The boy leaned on the table and realized that he would probably have to wait a while until his skill level rose. Suddenly, Kane saw the magic lamp and wondered if he couldn't just analyze it. The young man touched his glasses and said the word analysis, after which a lot of magic boards with information appeared in front of him. The Lord's son opened his mouth in amazement, because he saw many incomprehensible symbols. He wondered if it was a magical analysis. The boy suggested that he might be able to create a magic circle after he reached this state. Kane decided to try it and uttered the words from the magic of the magic circle. A board with a spirit star appeared between the boards with many symbols. Kane crossed his arms and assumed it was the magic circle of the magic lamp. He touched the rim of his glasses once more and began the analysis. The star was a magical circle of light made of living magic. The young man sat on a chair in front of the magic boards and thought about how he could use it if it was a level. And in general, didn't the light have a level? He did not understand what earth magic was, but decided that for now he needed to do something with this magic circle light, so he decided to rewrite it on parchment. A blonde-haired boy with glasses took out a parchment and placed it on the table next to a jar of ink. Kane was ready and hoped that everything would work out. The young magician loudly called for the transcription of the magic circle. The blue inkwell shook and ink began to pour out of it directly onto the parchment. Soon, the exact same star appeared on the piece of paper as on the information board. The boy took the parchment and thought that it had turned out well and now he would finally be able to use the magic of the magic circle. He thought about how it worked and decided to check by clicking on the glasses and saying the word analysis. The board that appeared said that he could use it by touching the light magic circle in the magic of life and channeling magic power. A joyful cane thought about how useful the analysis was and he definitely had to thank the hero for it. The boy decided that he had to try right now. He read the words that said that first he had to touch the magic circle, 
and let the magic go. Kane did everything according to the instructions, and the magic star disappeared from the parchment. The boy slammed his palms on the table and shouted that he had light magic. Looking at the board with a lot of incomprehensible symbols, he saw the shape of an inverted triangle, and wondered if there had been something like this before. The boy clicked on an unknown figure and a star of light appeared from it. Tane thought that it was cool, because a light magic circle appeared, and so he thought, could it be that he could store the magic circles he created? A young man could collect magic circles of different types of magic. If he collected them and copied them onto his tools, he would get a sword that sparkles with fire or an ice magic stick, and he would be able to use almost all types of magic. Kane thought about the power that followed. It was just amazing. New opportunities were opening up for him and there was so much more to do. The young magician performed a dance of joy, but his delight was interrupted by his sister, who was walking down the corridor and was angry, asking her brother where he had disappeared when it was almost time for dinner. The girl looked into the library and was delighted to see her brother dancing. When Cain saw Alice, he screamed in surprise and fright. There was a crowd of citizens in the capital. Hardy drove them away, asking them to take a step back. Cain sat on the ground and invoked the magic of stone, creating a road out of square cobblestones. A resident of the city thanked Mr. Cain for the amazing magic. Another man wanted to leave, but he was ordered not to be rude to Mr. Cain. The boy thanked his friend, a one-armed employee, and said that he thought it was time for them to return. Suddenly, someone praised the boy, calling out from behind. It was a young man with long blonde hair, Brother Ben. He told his younger brother that he was home now. Kane was surprised and tensed, thinking that it was a surprise. He greeted Ben on his return home, and the long-haired man explained that he saw the guy on the way to the mansion and decided to say hello first. Kane asked his brother if he was alone, but the man replied that he was with his brothers. Suddenly, two more blonde older brothers appeared. One of them was named Arthur St. Rose. He was 18 years old, and he was the eldest son of the house of St. Rose. The second guy was named Chris. He was 14 years old, and he was the third son. Arthur looked at Kane and said that he had grown up a lot. Chris added that he had not seen him for many years. The youngest brother had to lift his head up a lot to look into Arthur's eyes. He thought that he was huge, almost the same as their father. Kane greeted his brother uncertainly, and he screamed, asking if he remembered him. A muscular young man ruffled the guy's hair and pointed his finger at another brother standing behind him. He called him Skinny Chris and asked him not to forget it. The young magician had a huge elder brother's hand on his head and the boy thought about how big they were. Skinny Chris joined the conversation and asked her brother if he remembered him too, because he didn't play much because of his mom. Kane understood everything, and the older brother hugged the boy and informed him that from now on they would be friends. The youngest brother thought that the eldest was too close. Long-haired Ben came up to the young people and told the brothers that it was better for the two of them to leave everything as it was, otherwise Kane would get confused. The muscular brother offered to talk about it at home and asked Kane how he would get there. The boy explained that Randolph would be coming for him soon and he and Hardy had recently been working on the cobblestones. Chris was surprised and said that when he was Kane's age, all he could do was swing a sword. The eldest brother bent down and stared at the stone road. He asked if Kane had done everything himself, and the other brother knocked on the cobblestone. Ben knew about the construction from his mother's letters and that his younger brother had learned to use magic only last year but had already had such success. The long-haired brother thought about it and said that he did not know that the boy was not so simple. He offered to teach him something else. Looking at his older brother, the boy thought that he looked like the spitting image of a demon and did not change at all. The brawniest brother said that first of all, because of these cobblestones, people were happy, so he liked it and wondered if people in the city had ever been so lively. He asked his younger brother if he was really such a genius. The other brothers supported me and said that it was great and that they were surprised. Kane held his head and thought about how he was getting more and more confused. A mustachioed butler appeared next to the young people. He informed them that if they praised Mr. Kane again, he would fall and ask the boys to leave it. Arthur got mad and asked Randolph to stop calling him boy. A crowd of townspeople approached the St. Rose brothers. They all smiled and said that the young people had never been so close and wondered if these three were Mr. Kane's brothers, because people did not know that they had returned. The crowd welcomed the men back. They were glad that they were back. Looking at this, Kane thought that they must have been very popular. Butler Randolph came up to the carriage and informed them that they were going to return to the mansion, so he asked everyone to get into the carriage. Lady Lydia was waiting for all her sons at the entrance of the mansion. She ran up to them to hug them and shouted welcome back to everyone. Randolph informed Arthur that the owner was waiting for him in the living room. 
Alice came up to Ben and greeted her brother with a smile. The tall man bent down a little so that his sister could hear him. He informed her to come home and asked if she had become a little taller since last year. The little girl was delighted by her brother's words. Arthur also said that he and his sister had not seen each other for a long time and she had grown up a lot since their last meeting and had only become more beautiful. Alice pressed her hands to her cheeks and laughed. She was a little embarrassed. The elder brother stroked his sister's head. Kane thought that mother and sister Alice looked happy, and the brothers were also glad to see them. One of the St. Rose family members said that it was great that they were all here today. Luke greeted the arriving sons and expressed the hope that the trip was not long. He wished the guys a good rest today. The whole family was sitting at the table in the living room and laughing. Kane thought that his father looked very happy and he liked such a friendly family. Light was streaming into the library room from the doorway, and Kane was sitting over the hero's book. After dinner, the father called the three brothers to his office to talk about something, so the boy had some free time, and he decided to go to the library and read. He still wanted to build a sewer, it was needed to flush the toilets, and then the young magician was going to expand the city walls and maybe build a bathhouse. A voice called out to him, and the boy turned around, it was brother Chris. Surprised, the boy got up from his chair and asked his older brother if he could help him in any way. Chris said that the other brothers wanted to see him and asked if the boy would go to the room with him. Kane agreed and thought that something had happened. The older brother was surprised that the boy had already read books and said that he had never been a big fan and rarely went to the library. Kane reported that he was taking it, but wondered if it was normal. Chris informed Arthur that he had invited Kane, and the brothers entered the room. The boy was surprised that even his brothers did not enter there without permission and he took his role seriously. Chris came in and apologized, and Kane picked up and apologized too. Arthur was sitting on a chair by the window, serious, and Ben was standing next to him, thoughtful. The oldest brother said that it was great that Kane joined us and explained that he had called him here to chat a little about their situation. He added that he thought it was too early, but Benjamin gave his consent. The boy asked why not and stood in front of his brother. A blonde, muscular man asked if he understood that they were a noble family. Kane nodded quietly in agreement. His brother explained that they had four boys in their family, including him, so he decided to ask directly if he wanted to become the rightful heir. The boy was scared and thought that it was a ridiculous question out of the blue. The legitimate son was the heir to the title. In other words, the brother asked him, the fourth son, if he wanted to inherit. Cain was surprised by the suddenness of the question, but he already knew the answer. He briefly replied that no, he did not want to, and added that he wanted to help brother Arthur somehow for the good of the kingdom. But that was all. The older brothers were surprised and a smug Benjamin told Arthur that he had told him so. Arthur rubbed his eyes and wondered why everyone kept giving him the same answer. Chris spread his hands and explained what it was because when he looked at his father, he was busy with paperwork every day. It seemed to him that he was inundated with it for days. The other brothers laughed, and Arthur said that now that Kane had joined them, he decided to ask again, because his goal was to make the St. Rose family rich, and for this he needed the strength of all their family members. The man got up from his chair and bowed in front of the brothers. Cain was surprised by this gesture and opened his mouth, and the other brothers put their hand on their hearts and said in chorus that they serve the family. The younger brother turned his head from one side to the other and stammered, repeating after the brothers. They all laughed, and Arthur stroked the boy's head with a huge hand. The man folded his hands and said that these were all formalities. Tonight they would discuss the development of the region. Arthur put a bag tied with a rope on the table and offered to talk about who can do what. He also addressed Kane separately. The boy agreed, and the man unwrapped a bag containing bread, sausage, and cheese. The boy made a sandwich and began to eat it. Arthur said they would start with Chris, but Chris was surprised, and Ben added that he had nothing. After dinner, when Kane was not there, the men talked in the study. The father of the family thanked everyone for the reports and added that he had one more request. Luke said that as they all knew, Cain seemed to have changed a little after being baptized. It could have been due to his skills, or it could have been because he became more knowledgeable. Benjamin thought about how he felt it too when he was teaching him. Lord Luke reported that this was why he wanted the boys to look after the boy during his stay here, and also asked them to teach the reckless Cain to protect himself. Arthur put his hand on his chest and agreed, and Chris happily added that they would do it, because he was their dear brother. Ben also agreed and thought that the boy was very interesting, so he couldn't help but teach him different types of magic. However, Kane was only six years old. Benjamin was sitting in his room, copying something from a book onto parchment with a pen. 
Suddenly, he heard a sound and turned around, allowing him to enter. Kane looked into the room and apologized to his brother. He said that he needed to talk to him about something. Ben asked if there was a consultation, and the boy confirmed it. The younger brother said that he had several ideas to improve the quality of life on the estate, and he would really use the wisdom of brother Ben. The long-haired young man agreed and asked first of all to tell him about his ideas. Kane showed his brother two fingers and said that there were two things he wanted to build, a bathhouse and a sewer. Ben was surprised by the idea of a bathhouse, and he asked if the bathhouse was a barrel of hot water. The boy confirmed and explained that the bathhouse is a very large barrel that can accommodate a dozen people at once. He believed that access to it would make people's lives more hygienic and reduce the number of diseases. Another system was the sewerage system, where rainwater, sewage from toilets and so on are sent to a channel submerged underground in the city, wastewater is treated outside the territory and returned to the river. The boy thought that it would also improve sanitary conditions in the city and reduce the number of diseases. Ben opened his mouth, listening to his younger brother and raised his hand to his chin, thinking. He said that he was sure that people would be happy when it was all ready and he thought the ideas were great. Ben added that he couldn't believe that the boy had come up with such a thing at the age of six. Kane was pleased with the praise from his older brother, and he explained that he had learned about everything from the pictures in the hero's book because he would never have thought of it himself. Reluctantly, Ben believed his brother. At that moment, the boy was thinking that the book Heroes is not only valuable information, but also an excellent excuse, so he mentally thanked the hero. Benjamin asked Kane what he wanted him to help him with. The boy replied that he would need a lot of hot water, so if the fire magic that Ben possessed had magic for making hot water, then he would like his brother to show him how to use it. Benjamin was surprised and replied that he didn't have fire magicians to make hot water, but there was magic to raise and lower the temperature of water, and other things. He asked if that would be enough. The joyful boy confirmed and asked to show this magic. He wanted to make a magic circle with magic and a magic circle and create a magic tool. From what he heard, the elder brother sweated a little and asked if he could do this with the help of magic magic. Ben thought even harder and asked if there was a limit to how much his younger brother could surprise him. He added that with the help of the magic circle, any tools will be available to Kane. As expected of Ben, he had already realized the usefulness of the magic circle. Kane told his long-haired brother that there were limitations, because he could only conjure up to minus one level of magic magic. An activation required ten times more magic power than the original. Ben understood everything and said that tenfold magic power is quite a lot. He also asked how many magic powers the boy had now. Kane was a little embarrassed, but said he would tell him because he was his brother. The boy replied that the amount of his magic was endless. The brothers looked at each other, and Benjamin laughed out loud and added that Kane never stopped surprising him. Laughing, he clutched his stomach and apologized to his brother, thanking him for telling him this and promising that he would not tell anyone. The boy was delighted and agreed, and Ben tensed up a little and thought that Kane was growing faster than he thought, so he had to be careful with this. Ben decided to return to the topic and said that the magic that changes the temperature belonged to the second level of magic. Kane reported that, unfortunately, she was not of that level. The older brother was surprised and asked if the temperature changing magic was level 1 magic and how did the brother check it. The boy said that it was called the magic of life and for some reason it could be turned into a magic circle. In fact there was no magic that could change the temperature, and if a young man wanted to use the magic of life, then it was hot water. Ben added that anyone could be taught the magic of life in the church, so he advised his brother to come and talk to his father next time and learn. Kane did not even know that such direct magic existed. Benjamin was sitting in his room, copying something from a book onto parchment with a pen. Suddenly, he heard a sound and turned around, allowing him to enter. Kane looked into the room and apologized to his brother. He said that he needed to talk to him about something. Ben asked if there was a consultation, and the boy confirmed it. The younger brother said that he had several ideas to improve the quality of life on the estate, and he would really use the wisdom of brother Ben. The long-haired young man agreed and asked first of all to tell him about his ideas. Payne showed his brother two fingers and said that there were two things he wanted to build, a bathhouse and a sewer. Ben was surprised by the idea of a bathhouse, and he asked if the bathhouse was a barrel of hot water. The boy confirmed and explained that the bathhouse is a very large barrel that can accommodate a dozen people at once. 
He believed that access to it would make people's lives more hygienic and reduce the number of diseases. Another system was the sewerage system, where rainwater, sewage from toilets and so on are sent to a channel submerged underground in the city, wastewater is treated outside the territory and returned to the river. The boy thought that it would also improve sanitary conditions in the city and reduce the number of diseases. Then opened his mouth, listening to his younger brother and raised his hand to his chin, thinking. He said that he was sure that people would be happy when it was all ready and he thought the ideas were wonderful. Ben added that he couldn't believe that the boy had come up with such a thing at the age of six. Kane was pleased with the praise from his older brother, and he explained that he had learned about everything from the pictures in the hero's book because he would never have thought of it himself. Reluctantly, Ben still believed his brother. At that moment, the boy was thinking that the book Heroes is not only valuable information, but also an excellent excuse, so he mentally thanked the hero. Benjamin asked Kane what he wanted him to help him with. The boy replied that he would need a lot of hot water, so if the fire magic that Ben possessed had magic for making hot water, then he would like his brother to show him how to use it. Benjamin was surprised and replied that he didn't have fire magicians to make hot water, but there was magic to raise and lower the temperature of water, and other things. He asked if that would be enough. The joyful boy confirmed and asked to show this magic. He wanted to make a magic circle with magic and a magic circle and create a magic tool. From what he heard, the elder brother sweated a little and asked if he could do this with the help of magic magic. Ben thought even harder and asked if there was a limit to how much his younger brother could surprise him. He added that with the help of the magic circle, any tools will be available to Kane. As expected of Ben, he had already realized the usefulness of the magic circle. Kane told the long-haired brother that there were limitations, because he could only conjure up to minus one level of magic magic. An activation required ten times more magic power than the original. Ben understood everything and said that tenfold magic power is quite a lot. He also asked how many magic powers the boy had now. Kane was a little embarrassed, but said he would tell him because he was his brother. The boy replied that the amount of his magic was endless. The brothers looked at each other, and Benjamin laughed out loud and added that Kane never stopped surprising him. Laughing, he clutched his stomach and apologized to his brother, thanking him for telling him this and promising that he would not tell anyone. The boy was delighted and agreed, and Ben tensed up a little and thought that Kane was growing faster than he thought, so he had to be careful with this. Ben decided to return to the topic and said that the magic that changes the temperature belonged to the second level of magic. Kane reported that, unfortunately, she was not of that level. The older brother was surprised and asked if the temperature changing magic was level 1 magic and how did the brother check it. The boy said that it was called the magic of life and for some reason it could be turned into a magic circle. In fact there was no magic that could change the temperature, and if a young man wanted to use the magic of life, then it was hot water. Ben added that anyone could be taught the magic of life in the church, so he advised his brother to come and talk to his father next time and learn. Cain did not even know that such direct magic existed. Cain and Alice were standing at the city church. The boy thought that it was a long time ago. He remembered talking to his father about the magic of life. It turned out that this was common magic in this world and he seemed to be the only one who didn't know it. Alice asked her brother to come into the house as soon as possible. She was also with him when the boy was talking to his father. At lunch, Mother Lydia ordered her son to go and get ready with Alice before he went to church. The woman said that the other day they had already taken measurements from the traveling clothes that the boy would wear on a trip to the estate of Earl Shields. She also added that it looked like everything was ready and the finishing touches were left. They went shopping together that day. Kane had to put on and take off a lot of things. He hated such things. The blonde-haired boy ran to the door of the church. The Holy Father in a white robe greeted the children and said that he knew why they were here and asked them to follow him. The children replied that they were also glad to see him. In one of the rooms in the church building there was a fresco depicting Lady Guardia, the goddess. There were cross swords hanging above the door in this room, and there was a stone circle with a jewel in the middle on the floor. The church worker explained that the children would use this tablet to learn the magic of life. The Holy Father asked the children what magic of life they would like to learn today. Cain replied that he would like to learn hot water, but would also like to learn other good magics, if any. The boy also asked if it was possible. Could the Holy Father tell him about the story of the magic of life? The man replied that he could, but only briefly and began his story. Everyday life, as it was correctly called, was invented and spread by one hero in the past. It was said that the hero created it only because of one thought that there must be magic that would make life a little more convenient, 
Even if a person does not have the skills of magic itself, young Kane thought that the hero had created life, and the man in church clothes and mitre continued to tell the story. In the beginning, only a hero could bestow the magic of life. There was even a story in this world that the hero escaped for a short time because too many people came to him. So he created this stone slab and could bestow the magic of life in the church. Thus, the hero gave them the opportunity to receive payment for it. The boy listened enthusiastically to his father and thought that the magic created by reincarnation from Japan a long time ago was useful to people today. It made him happy. In total, there were ten living magics created by the heroes, but only nine have survived to the present day. Such magics included, light, fist-sized light appears, spirituality, warm air comes out of your hand within 30 seconds, cleaning, cleans the room in about six tatami mats, or cleanses one person to the size of a bathtub. There was also the magic of ignition, creates a spark of fire for 10 seconds, cleansing, sterilizes food and drinks, cooling, cools liquids to about minus 5 degrees Celsius, hot water, creates 500 cubes of boiling water, volume, makes the voice 5 times louder and magnifying glass, triple magnifying lens appears in a circle formed by the index finger and thumb. The St. Rose children listened in silence, and the man explained that they could check how much magic they could get by putting their hand on the tablet, and asked the guys if they wanted to try. Kane immediately agreed and walked over to the stone cube, which had two small depressions specifically for the hands. The Holy Father asked the boy to put his hand on a stone ledge. Parham obeyed and some kind of magical current passed through his hands, and the horcrux lit up. The church worker explained that since the stone glowed four times, the master could learn up to four varieties of magic. The boy turned around and said that then, please, he wanted hot water, light and a magnifying glass, and he would learn another one later when he wanted to master other skills. The Holy Father agreed and asked the boy to leave his hands where he had put them. The man began to pronounce unknown spells in an incomprehensible language, and the boy's hands lit up. Cain took his hands off the stone. A man with long blonde hair tied in a braid said that it looked like the boy had successfully learned magic, so he should check his fortune board later. Alice screamed that she also wanted to learn the magic of life and called the man a priest. The man agreed, and the boy thought that learning was very easy and he didn't even feel anything. But now he could use hot water to make hot water for baths. Cain immediately began to worry when he thought about what was coming. Alice also put her hands on the magic stone, and her brother said that he was happy for her, because she was able to learn purification and light. The girl laughed. She said that if she could only learn one magic, she would choose something else, but she was glad that she could learn as many as two. The guys thanked the priest for today and gave him a bag containing a donation. The boys were walking through the church and Cain, seeing Lady Guardia, closed his eyes and bowed to her. The sister turned around to say something to her brother, but saw that he was frozen in a bow, so she also joined him. The church employee said goodbye to the guys, and they left the building. Alice said that they had to go home because it would be time for dinner soon. Suddenly, an unfamiliar voice turned to the small children and asked for something. Kane and Alice saw a woman sitting on the ground and crying, with a small child in her arms, whose leg was bleeding. The woman begged to heal her brother's wound, and in return she promised to give them the money later. A young dark-haired church worker apologized to the girl, but reported that they asked everyone to pay on the spot and could not accept payment later. The girl continued to cry and beg to make an exception. The children of St. Rose noticed that no one reacted to the words of a stranger. It was clear to them that if the church made an exception for one person, then others would want the same thing. Cain thought that unlike his previous life, there were no guarantees here, that was how this world was arranged, but still the boy had healing magic. He took his fist and was going to approach the girl, but the sister tried to dissuade him and said that if he cured the boy now, then people would come to them every day, and he would not be able to heal them all. Cain understood this, but looked at his sister and saw that she was barely holding back tears. He realized that it was also difficult for her to leave everything like that because it was visible on her face. And yet, the young magician grabbed his sister's hand, screaming and pretending that her palm was damaged, so he would have to use a recovery spell. A church worker noticed the boy and he asked the priest if he could use restoring magic on Sister Alice. The man replied that if he wanted to use it on Alice Sama, then it was acceptable. The girl wanted to scream that she was not injured, but her brother did not let her finish and said that he had not seen anything, so he asked her to go out to the sun. The guys approached the crying girl and Kain directed the magic treatment to the area, spreading it to the injured boy's leg. The wound healed, and the strangers were very surprised, and Kane said that it was good, because the wound on Alice's arm had healed. 
The sly boy awkwardly scratched his head and noticed that people were in the range of his magic because he screwed up. The boy laughed and pulled Alice along, saying that they had to go. He also thanked the priest for today and ran away. The carriage of the Lord's children drove off, and the cured boy waved to the guys, and his older sister bowed. In the carriage, Alice told her brother that he was always inventing something and reminded him that she had said that it was impossible. Cain just smiled and confirmed it, and the girl said she was proud of him anyway. The older brother laughed and asked her not to tell her mother about it, because then he would give her one satsum for a snack. Cain lay on the bed in his room at the manor and thought about how he needed to build a bathhouse. He thought about what he would need first, because he was almost sure that he had been in the bathhouse in his reincarnation. He remembered that first you come, and then you take off your slippers, then you undress in the locker room and go to the sauna. The boy wondered how to make a shower and whether a bathtub and a chair were needed. They made soap from them, so everything was fine with that, but Cain thought about towels. He decided that next time he would make a sauna. Soon, the young man received his father's consent to build a bathhouse and decided to make it near the back entrance to the mansion. Since the older brother Ben went hunting with his father, it was decided to build a bathhouse together with Hardy. The boy pointed out to the muscular gardener an empty place on the ground near the bushes and asked what size he wanted a bathhouse. The man said that if it was too small, it would be difficult to enter the house, and if the bathhouse was too big, it would be difficult to keep the water inside hot. Hardy thought for a while and asked Mr. Kane what a sauna was. The boy remembered that magic was used in this world for self-purification, so some people did not know what a bathhouse was. There was no need to make a bathhouse if there was magic, but such an invention was necessary for people who did not know purification or who could not donate to the church. Cleansing, of course, was useful. One of the maids came up to the children and said that it was time for both of them to go to bed, so she asked them to use the cleansing before going to bed. The blonde girl only gently touched the boy's hands, and Mr. Kane was already clean. Now it was Mistress Alice's turn, and the girl did the same thing. Such magic only cleansed the dirt on the surface of the body, but did not relieve fatigue inside, and Kane wanted to soak in the bathroom and relax to relieve the fatigue of the day which is why they had to build a bathhouse. Kane explained to Hardy what a sauna was and the muscular man was surprised, but understood everything. The boy added that, then, the bathhouse should be large enough to accommodate three adults, because when the hostess goes there, the maids will also go and wash it. The man immediately imagined three pretty girls in towels, but shook his head to knock these thoughts out of her. Kane went on to argue that then the bathhouse should be big enough for more than three adults. They also needed a window, so he asked Hardy if he could make it somewhere. The man was surprised and replied that he did not know, but would ask Mr. Randolph. In addition to the window, a roof was also needed, so the Lord's son wondered if he should have imagined a stone wall with voids, or would he build a stone wall, and then remove its contents using magic, like last time. The young builder needed to think about the order, otherwise he would not be able to make a bath. When the boy tried this before, he could not connect a stone wall on top of another wall, so he thought that he would have to think carefully before starting construction. While the young man was thinking, Hardy brought Mr. Randolph and thanked the young gentleman for waiting. Mrs. Knoll was also in the house, so he called her. The girl in the jacket and tie greeted the boy joyfully and said that they had not seen each other for a long time and she had heard that he needed her help, so she came. Mr. Kane was delighted and thanked Noel. He added that she came very opportunely. The butler politely asked which window his master was talking about. The boy explained that the window was designed for ventilation, so it should not have opened too wide, and it should not have been visible from the outside. The boy outlined the idea of a window, and suggested making it so that in the window it was possible, for example, to move the lower part from the inside out. Randolph was surprised and asked again. He added that it was a laborious job, but promised that he would deliver the windows home tomorrow. The young builder told the butler Randolph that he would like him to bring several more different sizes and formats of windows. The boy also asked Noel to help him with the construction of the bathhouse. He explained that it would consist of a bathtub, a washing room and a changing room. The boy accompanied his explanation by bending three fingers in turn. Also, the young gentleman needed a locker room to accommodate three adults, and also had a room for storing additional hot water. Kane clutched his head and said that he thought he could create space by hollowing out walls, but it was difficult for him to make interior walls or a bathtub. The girl from the department asked if it was necessary to create all the magic. Kane was surprised and looked up, and the girl continued to say that let him do what can only be done with magic and let the guild of masons or carpenters take over other things. Noel asked the young gentleman, how was this option for him? 
Kane and Hardy were surprised and opened their mouths. They looked at each other and agreed with the girl. The boy shouted that it was difficult for him to do everything with magic, so they only needed to make walls and a bathtub with magic, and the roof, and the rest could be done with ordinary construction. The young man thanked the girl, and she bowed and said that she was glad to help. Kane said that then they would start creating everything except the roof and leaned his palms against the ground and used the magic of the stone wall. The earth began to change and rose, turning into huge smooth stone walls. Next, the boy was going to make openings for the door and window. He folded his palms and thought that first he needed to mash the magic in the right amount to make it small and divide it into several small pieces. Kane completed all the preparatory steps and removed the parts of the wall in which the doors and windows will be located. The butler noted that it was great, and Noel was surprised that everything was amazing all at once. Hardy sat down and asked what happened to the ground and were they going to make cobblestones. The construction wizard explained that they would make a low pavement and a stone floor, and in the bathroom the floors would be slightly tilted to provide drainage. He asked the assistants to look and use the stone wall magic again, which caused a sloping cobblestone floor to appear on the ground. The gardener said that it was great, and the boy went to the wall and touched it. He reported that the frame of the building had taken shape, but there were still a few gaps, and a little polishing was also needed. Noel thought that they had already saved a lot of time and effort on construction thanks to Mr. Kane, and he already wanted to move on to the next stage. The girl decided that the young gentleman was a very ambitious man. The joyful boy reported that they then moved on to the bathtub and again used stone wall magic, and then removal magic. As a result of the use of several magical powers, a rectangle appeared inside the future bathhouse, representing a bathtub. The builder said that everything was ready, and the audience screamed and opened their mouths in surprise. Hardy reached into the tub with his only hand and realized what it was like. The boy also added that he had touched up everything with clay. The girl with the tail noted that all that remained was to fill the cavity with hot water. Kane smiled, but suddenly remembered that he hadn't thought about the plumbing. Sweat was running down his face. The boy leaned against the future bathtub and silently stared into it. The builders of the bathhouse looked to the future of the bath, and Kane could not decide what to do with the plumbing. The boy shared his thoughts that he should have built a bathhouse a little closer to the well. Now he had to think about a water pipe. The head of the department in the city asked the boy what a water pipe was. Kane was a little surprised, but explained that it was a pipe through which water flowed, because it was difficult to carry water back and forth every time people used the bathroom. So he decided to build a pipe so that water flowed from the well right here, which would reduce the amount of work on carrying water. The guy added that even if you make a pipe out of clay, it is likely to mix with the soil with prolonged use. All the construction participants made thoughtful faces. Suddenly, Kane realized that he could use it and called up a board with information and skills, on which appeared an inscription telling about the press for earth. With the help of a press, it was possible to press on the surface of the earth to smooth and harden it. Kane thought that if the soil would harden like concrete, then it would be possible to continue working with it. The boy turned to the young men and the butler who were watching him and said that he needed their help again. And so, the boy told his father through Randolph that he was going to run the water supply from the well to the bathhouse, and with his permission resumed work. In the process of creating a water pipe, the boy made several mistakes, which caused the pipes to burst and break. But Noel came to the rescue and figured out how to do the tilt, because she was from the maintenance department. It took a long time, but the young people managed to put the well and the water supply in order. After completing the work, Kane was all dirty, but thanked everyone for their help. The girl replied that she was glad that she was able to help Mr. Kane. Hardy said that they were very tired. All three looked at each other and smiled. Did Gardy specify whether it was only necessary to fill the water supply with water? The boy confirmed, but added that he would like to fill the tub half full first. But it was also not an easy job, so he invited his assistant to stay. All the people involved in the construction took turns pumping water from the well to get half of it. Later, the guys got tired and took a short break, and Kane created simple chairs with magic to sit on them and drink some water. The boy was thinking that they should have come up with a better way to do this every day. The workers brought the plumbing directly to the tub, and Kane used the magic of hot water to add more boiling water and bring it to the desired temperature. Butler Randolph noted that the water had only risen by half in the bathroom, so he asked the young gentleman what he was going to do next. The young magician decided to demonstrate everything clearly and hot water poured out of his hands. At this time, the boy thought that he had never used such a device, and it turned out to be very convenient. Kane dipped his hand into the water and touched it, then decided to add more hot water. 
The hot water in the tub rose by about three quarters of the total mass and then stopped. The young man said that they had done a great job and he would say that the temperature in the bathroom was just right now. The boy called Hardy, Noel and Randolph to try to touch the water. The girl was surprised that it was a bathtub, and the gardener, dirty from work, said that it was somehow very hot there. Kane thought that maybe this was a normal reaction when you see a bathtub for the first time. The girl and the muscular man dipped their hands into the water and said that the water was just right, not too hot and not too cold, and Hardy added that he could definitely soak in it for a long time. After hearing the happy reviews, the young man asked his friends, why don't they all enjoy it? Noel understood and immediately jumped on the wall in the bathroom, putting her feet in the water. The other employees followed her lead. The girl said that she had no idea how this water warmed her feet. Hardy noted that the water quickly relieved fatigue. The smiling gardener turned to the girl and said that he was glad that she liked it. Kane thought about it and decided that she would really be happy to take such a bath, but he did not think about drainage. Kane St. Rose clutched his head and screamed, which caused the adults to pay attention to him and ask what happened. The boy apologized to everyone and asked for help making the drain. His assistants asked him not to apologize so much and replied that they had worked hard. When the young people finished, the sun had already set and dusk was gathering. The drain was ready and the water from the tub began to flow into it. The little boy said that he was so tired and wanted to take a bath, but it was so hard for him to even walk to it and go in. Kane grimaced and thought about how the world was so perfect. The boy decided that no matter what it took, he would take a hot bath tomorrow and clenched his fists. Kane turned around and politely asked his friends to come tomorrow too. The guys agreed and said that was enough for today, and the butler added that it was time for Mr. Kane to have dinner. A starry sky appeared above the Saint Rose family's estate. The St. Rose family dined in full, including all four brothers. Arthur and Chris were thinking about something and looked very tired. Chris was even sweating. Kane drew attention to the older brothers. He was surprised that they could handle so much paperwork, so he wondered how hard the Lord's job could be. Lady Lydia told her sons that they needed to collect their thoughts. The woman got up from the table and added that the amount of work done in the morning was still small and she asked Chris when he would have a girlfriend and advised him to take the initiative. The mother did not understand what was happening to her sons and why they were so exhausted, so she invited them to look at Alice, who was full of energy. Kane was surprised and asked his sister if she was tired of studying. Then Chris clutched his head and shouted that he had visited ten shops in one day without a break, which is why the youngest brother came to the conclusion that he was on a tour of the estate. The caring younger brother decided that Chris needed to have a bath as soon as possible. The next morning, workers from the city came to the St. Rose estate. A dark-haired, muscular man with a scar on his face wished Mr. Kane good morning. Noel explained that the strangers were craftsmen from the Guild of Masons and the Guild of Carpenters. Kane also wished the men good morning and said that he wanted them to make a roof, door and windows in this bathhouse. The boy brought the men to the facility and added that he needed them to fix the bathtub inside as well. The carpenters and masons examined the tub and thought about it, and the boy asked how soon they would be able to do everything. The dark-haired man gave a thumbs up and said that he thought they would manage before dark. This made the young magician very happy. Then the merchants brought wood and plaster, they all started working. The workers turned to the boy more than once. By lunch the roof frame was already ready. Kane looked at his building and thought that it was exciting for him to watch the bathhouse take shape. The chief worker from the city approached the boy and asked if he could ask a question. Kane beat him to it and asked if they had found anything missing or poorly installed. The muscular man waved his hands in denial and explained that few craftsmen would be able to build a room with such a solid foundation. But nevertheless, he had to say that this bathroom was a little chilly. The man with the scar offered to put stoves in the locker room because he thought it would help. Kane was very surprised and asked if they had a stove. The construction boy had not seen any furnaces yet, but he shouted joyfully that the furnace sounded perfect, because it was hard to take a bath in a cool room. The young gentleman asked if they could install an additional furnace. The male foreman replied that they could prepare her as soon as possible. The boy asked if it was expensive, because if it was very expensive, then let the builders just tell him what it looks like, and he will do everything. The man smiled and replied that the payment for the stove would be enough. In return, the builder asked to build fences around it. Kane agreed and entered the bathhouse. He used the magic of the wall and created a clay corner on a small platform. The astonished adult worker told that he had heard many stories about the boy, but he continued to surprise him. 
After that, Kane dried the plaster with magic and added chairs and the baths themselves for the bathrooms also with magic. Noel told one of the workers, who was carrying wooden sticks with one hand, that it was amazing that so many things could be done at once. But suddenly the girl saw Hardy, who was carrying twice as many sticks, while having only one fully functional arm. Work resumed again after lunch, and the roof was finished when the sun began to set. Everything was ready and Kane and the workers cheered. The young people congratulated Mr. Kane, and the girl with the tail said that, as she thought, the magic of the earth of the gentleman was simply amazing. The boy did not understand and asked what she was talking about, because everything was thanks to their help. Kane thanked the workers in return, because thanks to them they got the best bathhouse. The young people were surprised and even more delighted. After work, the young son of the Lord prepared for today's trip to the bathhouse. He laid out towels, high-quality soap, clothes and other things necessary for the bath. He also installed several lamps using the living magic of light, and at the same time explained to the maids how to use the bathroom. A mother approached the young magician builder and informed him that one of the maids had told her about the bathhouse, so Lydia was surprised that her son was able to build such a beautiful thing. The mother of the St. Rose family went on to say that Randolph had told her that everything had worked out only thanks to Kane's guidance and magic, so she thought it was very cool. The son began to deny the woman's words and explained that it was all thanks to everyone's help. Lydia smiled and asked if the guys would mind if she joined their trip to the sauna. No one was against it, but suddenly Alice screamed that she wanted to go there too, so Kane had to agree. Mother, brother and sister gathered in the bathhouse together, but suddenly the boy realized something and made a very surprised face. Luke and Benjamin St. Rose returned from hunting to the estate and were greeted on the doorstep by the rest of the family and the servants. The young men brought a whole cartload of captured blackbirds. Kane was surprised by the prey and asked if the two of them had caught all these white-tailed gulls. Ben replied complacently that they had caught only about 15 birds, and his father added that they had also caught a wild boar. Lady Lydia approached the men and said that she couldn't wait for what they would cook for their New Year's Eve party. Kane looked at his mother and smiled and thought that she was much more lively this year next to his brothers. St. Rose's youngest son was still in this world and he was turning seven years old. After the family distributed their catch, Kane showed his older brothers, father, mother and sister the bathhouse. Arthur walked into the new building and enthusiastically said that he had never seen anything like it. It was just amazing. Chris was also surprised and added that they didn't even have such facilities in the capital. Muscular Arthur stroked the clay structure in the middle of the room and asked if it was the same tub that the boy was talking about. The man added that it was so big that it could accommodate the whole family. Benjamin stood on the sidelines and thought that even though Kane had told him everything, he had still built an entire building. The long-haired man thought that it was beyond the power of a six-year-old child. Alice took a clay ladle and examined it. Kane made chairs and baths out of simple clay, but in the future he wanted the master to make them out of wood, because the clay was a little heavy. The boy was going to install a milk container or something like that, but his mother screamed that it was not good to drink in the bathroom, and even naked, it was not aristocratic. Kane would not mind drinking milk and thought about who would take a bath first. The boy assumed that his father would do it as the head of the family. Luke St. Rose immediately replied that Lydia would be the first. The children were surprised, and the girl asked her husband if it was true. The man replied that the woman was waiting for this the most. Kane smiled and thought that his father had been so kind. Lydia smiled sweetly and said that so be it. The mother suddenly pushed her son to the tub and said that she would go after Cain and Alice. The boy knew this would happen. St. Rose's mother and younger children changed into towels. Cain said that he liked the locker rooms here and because of the stove it was warm there. The blonde young man also explained to his family that there was also a basket there so as not to confuse his clothes with someone else's, so it was convenient for everyone. Alice reported that she undressed first, and her brother thought that she really resolutely took up her clothes, but decided to keep silent anyway. Fonda Alice was undressing. Her mother advised her to let her hair down first. Kane went to the bathroom and explained to the girls that when they entered the bathhouse, the first thing they should do was pour themselves a hot bath, using a tub to scoop up hot water. First, the water had to be slowly poured over the legs, and why pour hot water over the whole body? Lydia and Alice doused themselves with water from ladles. The girl screamed that she was very hot. Her brother explained to her that if she poured everything on herself, her body would react accordingly. The girl was unhappy and said that her brother should have been told about it earlier. Kane recalled that he had already said this, and now he offered the girls to wash their hair and took soap. The builder explained that after they poured some water on their hair, they needed to lather it with soap. 
The soap foamed easily if you let in air. Kane demonstrated the whole process and lathered his hair. He advised using foam to rub your hair well and then just wash off the foam. Mother Lydia asked her son to wait and approach the boy, saying that there was not enough foam behind him, so she informed him that she would wash Kane. The lady put on a towel and soaked her son's head, and the boy relaxed and thought that his mother's hands were gentle and pleasant. Alice called out to her brother and showed him the horns of hair that she had made with foam. Kane was surprised and asked his sister if they were dragon horns. The girl screamed that they were rabbit ears. Kane replied to his sister that he had learned that she had a unique sense of beauty. The boy remembered how he had not previously recognized the wolf in his sister's drawing. After that, Lydia's mom also washed her hair, and all her younger children laughed at her fluffy head. Girls with long hair had some difficulties in the process of washing in the bath. Lady Lydia and Alice were clumsily and intensely lathering their heads. Kane watched the girls and understood why this happened, because before their hair was washed by maids. But the mother smiled and said that she wanted to try to wash herself today with the help of her son and they decided to do everything themselves. The young man closed his eyes and smiled. He believed that there was nothing better than washing with his family. Next, Cain advised his mother and sister to wash the body and they sat down and began joyfully rubbing everything except their heads with wet soapy rags. Lady Lydia wrapped her wet hair in a towel and said in surprise that she could not reach her back. The woman did not understand what she had to do. Alice came up to her mother, smiled and said that she would wash her. The woman thanked her daughter. The younger sister told her brother that he would wash her back, after which the boy happily agreed and approached his sister with a soapy cloth. All the family members took turns washing each other's backs. The daughter stood in front of the mother. Cain stood in front of her and they all smiled and washed each other's backs at the same time. The young man happily thought that it was a family back massage. He always wanted to do it in his previous life but he never got the chance. The young man was massaging his back. He thought that he had never thought that he would be able to experience this in another world. Alice interrupted her brother's thoughts and asked if he really liked her washing him so much. The girl did not let the boy answer and joyfully shouted that then she would wash him even more thoroughly. Kane screamed in surprise. After everyone had thoroughly soaped each other's backs, the mother and the children climbed into a bath with warm and water, and after that they all closed their eyes with pleasure and gave a joyful sigh. Lady Lydia, with a towel on her head, said that she was pleased to soak in hot water, after which she asked the children if it was true. Blonde Alice with her hair wrapped in a bun was lying on her back and stuck her feet out of the water. She said that it was also nice for her to stretch her legs and it relieved fatigue so much. The young construction magician watched the girls and smiled. He thought that such a pleasant pastime could not be experienced only with the help of magic. The boy decided that it was good that they had built a bathhouse after all. The clean bath pioneers changed their clothes and left the steam room, after which Lady Lydia apologized to her husband for making him wait. Steam was coming from the mother along with the children, and Luke St. Rose smiled and said that there was nothing wrong with that. He noticed that they were in the bath for a short time, so he asked how it went. Lydia touched her cheek with her hand, smiled broadly and said that it turned out to be much better than she expected. Her hair and body were cleaner and fresher than usual. The girl's washed blonde hair was tied in a bun with a rag, and there was a bow on top of her head. Alice smiled and joined her mother. She added that they were all washing each other's backs, and her other older brother was surprised and said that it sounded funny, after which he asked how they did it. The father of the family and other older brothers went towards the bathhouse, and the man said that they were going to have fun in the bathhouse. So Lydia wished the young people good luck, calling them dear. Kane watched everything that was happening, smiled and thought that his brothers got along well with each other. The boy was sure that they would like to wash each other's backs. Suddenly, someone shouted loudly from the bathhouse. The blonde-haired young man was screaming and indignant because Benjamin was washing his back too much. Chris turned around and complained to his brother that he was skinning him. Benjamin told the focused one that his skin was just not trained enough, so he asked what it was like to rub it with ice. The long-haired man showed his brother a piece of ice, and the guy screamed, asking why he couldn't admit he was wrong. All the older brothers of the family sat on clay stools and rubbed each other's backs with soapy rags. The whole chain was closed by the father. The eldest son of the family was focused and thought about whether this situation meant that his father would have to wash his back. The young man only managed to tell his father about his back. But Luke smiled and asked Arthur not to be shy. The man turned around, asking again, and the Lord leaned a soapy cloth against his son's back and said that he had fun washing the backs of his adult sons. Arthur was tense at first, but soon a small smile appeared on his face. Luke St. Rose was soaping and kneading his eldest son's back. He said that he had become very strong. 
so he was proud of Arthur, and also asked him to take care of their lands. The young man tensed up and looked very confident, after which he agreed, after which, together with his father, he turned to the other brothers Chris and Benjamin and asked how long the two of them would fight. At this time, Cain was walking down the corridor of his estate and licking his lips, thinking that the dish they had for dinner was delicious, it was crispy chicken seasoned with salt. The boy kept walking and thought that after a relaxing bath, he also ate delicious food. He threw both hands in the air and shouted that the bath was a success. Suddenly, someone called Mr. Kane and three worried maids in aprons and caps stood in the corridor. The girls asked the boy if he was sure that they could also use the sauna. The young magician, Builder confirmed the girl's words and added that this would also be a test for the future distribution of baths in the territory, so that they could not hesitate to use them. He in turn would like them to report everything they noticed when using. All the maids smiled, were delighted and began to bow, thanking their young master. Kane showed them his palm and smiled, he thought that he hoped they would like it, because they all looked so happy. Kane suddenly saw the dark-haired servant Lara and thought that it was so sudden. But the girl told Mr. Kane that it was a great job and she heard that he had prepared another great dish. The young inventor lowered his eyes and thought that this maid always approached him unexpectedly. He got a little nervous. Laura asked the boy if he would go shopping tomorrow, because Master Randolph had asked her to accompany him. Kane confirmed a little awkwardly and remembered that tomorrow he was going to go and buy what he had wanted for a long time. The Lord's son remembered how the mustachioed butler had informed him that Laura knew about it, so she would go and show him everything. The gentleman and the maid were walking along the corridor, and the boy reported that he had heard that Lara knew a lot about the trading tent and guilts. The girl in the apron and cap confirmed her master's words and added that they had helped her a lot in the past, so she had been there often. Kane was surprised and asked again. The girl giggled, mysteriously folded her palms, smiled and told the young gentleman that she would wait patiently with her for tomorrow. The maid Lara, in her work clothes, together with Mr. Kane, entered the shop, and the joyful boy opened his eyes and mouth wide and said that it was lively there. The shop sold magical fish in aquariums, unusual birds in cast iron cages, other stalls sold a variety of spices and potions. An old woman in a headscarf sat on the ground and sold exotic fruits and vegetables. A muscular man was holding a box in his hands and a stern woman with aprons and a hat pointed at the box with her finger and ordered to put this product in the next area. The man obeyed, and another employee asked Monica what to do about it. The woman asked to give it here, and the third man asked where it was better for him to put the next product. Laura greeted Monica, which drew her attention to herself. She asked if the woman had a minute. Monica in the hat wondered if today was the delivery day, after which she tensed up and asked if the girl had any bad news. Laura showed her palms and began to deny, calming the woman asking not to worry, because on the contrary, she had good news. The maid pointed to the little boy standing behind her and informed her that she had brought Mr. Kane with her today. Monica looked at the joyful boy and asked if it was Mr. Kane himself. The maid confirmed and added that this was Monsieur St. Rose, the fourth son of the Viscount St. Rose. Kane looked politely and a little embarrassed at the strange woman and thought that Lara was doing great. Monica took hold of the hem of her dress and bowed at the sight of the Lord's son. She smiled and said that it was a great honor for her to welcome them to the Pedro Chamber of Commerce today. The woman said that her name was Monica and she was glad to meet them. Kane smiled and thanked the woman for such a warm welcome, after which he added that he was also glad to meet her. I asked the guy to give it up, because they should have been thanking him for his kindness. They were always happy to see him here. The woman smiled and called the boy Mr. Cobblestone, which made him smile awkwardly and wonder what kind of Mr. Cobblestone it was. The young builder turned to his maid and asked what it meant. The girl in the receipt was surprised and in response asked if he knew, because people in the city called him that and since the time when he built the road, the nickname stuck to him. The surprised boy opened his mouth, wondering if it was true. Monique asked her guests if something had happened. Kane replied that nothing had happened, but at that moment he thought that he had no idea about it. On the sides of the street there were tables with a variety of goods, which included both vegetables, fruits and pottery. Lord's Cheese apologized for bothering the woman at such a busy time, but found out that Lara had told him that he could find what he needed at Pedro's Chamber of Commerce. Monica smiled and cupped her hands. She understood. That's what it was. I explained that the Pedro Chamber of Commerce would do everything possible to provide Mr. Kane with what he wanted. A woman in a skullcap leaned over to the joyful boy and asked what he was looking for. 
The young construction magician said that he was looking for oil from a plant and some small black seeds, after which he asked if they had bird eggs. After hearing about the oil from plants, Monica asked again and explained that the oil they bought the other day was from beans. The woman worriedly put her hand to her chin and said that she thought so, and then asked if the boy could take a look at their small black seeds and eggs. Kane agreed, adding that if it was possible, then she asked to tell what the boy needed them for. The young man smiled again, spread his hands and explained that he wanted to make sweets for his sister Alice. Monica smiled back and said that it was wonderful. The boy turned away at that moment and thought that it was his apology for the fact that last time he had a snack on baked potatoes without her. She turned around in search of ingredients for sweets and asked her young guest to wait a minute. After a while, there was a mysterious oil on the table in front of the Lord's son black seeds in a bag and unusual eggs with stripes and specks. The boy leaned over the table and said that they already had everything. The employee smiled and replied that it was less that they could not do for Mr. Karin and they would bring the things they bought to the mansion. The young man asked the woman to do this and thought that he had already half given up the idea of learning everything. And Laura, it turns out, had connections with a large chamber of commerce. The Lord's son held out his hand to the woman and thanked her, which made her smile and ask him to return. On the way back to the mansion, the boy turned to the maid and explained that next he wanted to buy a magic stone, so he asked where it could be bought. Laura said that the boy had strange requests, but she raised her index finger and explained that if he wanted to get something like this, then she thought he should have turned to the guild to seek adventure. Hearing about the guild, the boy's eyes sparkled, and he wondered if this was the one. Tense and joyful with excitement, the young gentleman shook and wondered, because he was wondering if she was as cool as she used to be in games. The maid bent over her young master and watched in surprise at his strange reaction. At that time, in one of the buildings of the capital, on the signboard of which was depicted a shield of crossed swords, men in armor and equipment were standing and discussing something. Kane saw the strangers and realized that this was the Adventurer's Guild. He turned to the maid and enthusiastically clenched his fists, and asked if he could go and buy himself, because it was his business. The boy absolutely could not contain his curiosity, but the maids disappointed him by replying that he categorically could not. The serious maid grabbed her apron and asked who would protect Mr. Karin if he went there. The woman explained that if the boy got hurt, he would be scolded by Master Randolph. The young inventor only smiled in response and said that Lara was more afraid that Randolph would be angry with her than if he got hurt. The maid was very surprised, and the guy replied that he understood her, because Randolph's expression did not change. But when he was angry, he really scared. The boy remembered the moment when the mustachioed butler with a swollen vein on his head menacingly said that if he played in this place, he would definitely die. Laura was shaking and screaming that it was true and Master Randolph was a pain in the neck, but he cared about the boy's well-being. Kane told the maid that she was very honest, and the girl replied that the young gentleman was happy and he should not have had the desire to do dangerous things on his own. Kane thought about it and said that his mother had told him the same thing. The maid was also thinking, while the boy looked at her and awkwardly scratched the back of his head. The young magician, inventor raised his index finger up and said that this is what they are doing now. The young man wondered why the maid would not go ahead of him and guard the walls, and if he was in danger, she would help. Laura tensed and squeezed her eyes shut, but after that she agreed and added that if something happened, she would come running. Kane was serious and thought it was time for him to come in. 